And the hashtag is NYU Accra Lit Sim. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the third, the anthology, short and sweet. And the trio are ready. Remy, Dilma, and Nanekia Brew Hammond. Let's welcome them as they usher us into the third of a five part. And I promise you this is going to be exciting. Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I am so excited to be here with Remy. <laughs> I'm excited to be here with Remy and Dilman, and um, we're going to be talking about anthologies and, in particular, short stories. Um, so, um, sort of by show of hands, how many of you are short story fans? Okay. Oh, awesome. Okay, cool. Cool. All right. So you've come to the right <laughs> discussion. Um, so I'm going to open because I would love for um, Dilman to share um, a short excerpt of um, one of his shorts. And then we'll, we'll move on to Remy, and then um, we'll start talking about short stories. OK. Um, is this on? I'm going to read from uh, uh, this is my most recent collection. But the title story was in the Ken oh, yeah. Prize Anthology, 20, I think 2019, 2018, I'm not sure. Hello? Oh, yeah. What was happening? <laughs> okay, so I'm going to read from um, a short story that was in the anthology, uh, one of the Ken Prize anthologies, I think 2018, 2020, but it made the title of my most recent collection, uh, Where Rivers Got to Die. <coughs> he reached the valley where all rivers were buried and in the moonlight, so it was a, a lot shallower than in the stories. His body trembled with hunger and exhaustion and pain. Still, he refused to cry. Sweat clung to his skin like slime. He swayed feeling the weight of his body on his right foot, the soul cracked and bleeding, feeling the pain of carrying his left leg, which was twisted and hung in the air like a twig on a dead tree. They had taken away his kobe, and he destroyed his leg. They prohibited him from using a crutch, and they banished him from the village, claiming something evil had possessed him, something that lived in the valley. He strained his eyes, examining the shadows for signs of evil. He saw nothing. He waited to feel it in the air, but he did not know what evil felt like. He only knew about it from the stories. He was a good child. He, did not, he had not meant to kill his ma. He knitted his brows tight to force back tears, so tight that his head hurt. He slumped onto a stone. His teeth clat clattered. He hugged himself for warmth and watched the shadows dance as the moon rest amidst the clouds. Then it faded away, and the sun rose like a flame, like Mars' flame, behind clouds. He still saw no signs of evil in the valley. I'm sorry, Ma. The sun warmed up, and he finally decided what to do. He would go to his aunt. She would heal his leg and give him a new life. Her village was a day's flight on a kobe. Walking, it was more than ten days. Hoping, he might take two whole moons, and he did not know the way. He would set off in a random direction, hoping to chance upon a village where they had not heard of him, and ask for a map. Maybe Anabiba will give him a Kobe ride. He could, not, he, he could not stay on the plateau, for it was nothing but hostile rock. The valley, however, had a carpet of soft reddish sand. It will be a short descent, just about the height of a tall tree. The cliff had enough holes to make it easy, but he wondered if, with one good leg, he could climb down comfortably. He had been atop a tree harvesting mangoes for other children when he had learned about Ma's death. Yet, he had climbed down as though he, she had called him for lunch. If he had reacted with theatrical grief, maybe they would not have thought of him as evil. He wrapped his loincloth, the only thing that allowed him to leave the village with, on his foot so that the blood would not make it too slick. Then, he started to descend. He lost his grip and fell. In the three heartbeats it took to reach the ground, he prayed it was hard enough to shatter all his bones and pulp his flesh. It will be a happy ending. 
he would not have taken his own life. Like Ma's death, it would have been an accident. His body slammed against the sand. For a few moments, he did not feel anything. A desperate hope surged that he had died and would be reunited with Ma. She would, not, she would know he had not intended to kill her, that he had not killed her. She would love him as she had always loved him. Then the pain came. He gritted his teeth and stiffened his muscles. He wished he had his Kobe. It would have stopped the agony. It would have healed him and given him a new leg. Wow, thank you so much. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you so much for being here. I'm reading from a short story called Fulbright, which is from the Relations Anthology, uh, an anthology of African and diaspora voices edited by none other than Nana Ekua Bu Hammond. Thank, so, you for, <laughs> thank you for contributing that brilliant story. Yeah. So, yeah, I'll read from Fulbright. And in light of our, the generous host of this um, festival, I'll change the university in question. <laughs> the name of the university in question. <laughs> New York University in New York City. That's where I'm heading. When I tell my seatmate, Caroline, Caroline Weaver, but please call me Carol, a chatty British lady on her way to the United States to visit her family, she's startled. She sits up straight and fastly adjusts the seatbelt's pinch. Our destination, Trump's America. I'd have preferred to be going to the United States in the Obama years when the promise of black excellence in that country was high, when that proverbial 400-year corner had been turned. Still, it has to be admitted, even by me, that Agent Orange steers the ship that is the United States. If there's a country with a reputation that can survive a despot, it's the one that gave us Muhammad Ali, Michael Jackson, and Michael Jordan, the three M's whose reputations and achievements remain unimpeachable by scandal wherever black people are found. Caroline is headed to some tumbleweed town in the Midwest with a biblical name. Her daughter teaches at a university there. That's how we started talking. I'm going to see my Katie. She's an art history lecturer. I wanted her to leave me alone so I could return to my podcast. And the robotic smile the icy stewardess gli uh, that the icy stewardess gli uh, gliding down the plane gave me. When we taxied onto the runway, Caroline took a break from telling me about Camden, where she worked at the British Library, her interest in tap dancing, keeps the old legs going, you know, and her Katie's move to the United States, which was just bad business, really, what with this Trump fellow in charge now? And where are you headed, dear? I dropped New York University between us, like the armrest, letting her know which side was mine and which was hers. The plane sprinted down the runway, vibrating with its effort. Caroline's eyebrows lifted as the wheels left the ground. You don't say, I do say. <laughs> Thank you both so much for those really powerful moments from your stories. One of the things that I love about short stories is that they enable you to sort of focus um, on a singular moment, a singular point, um, and, and convey um, something in a, in a really strong way that um, sort of longer narratives don't allow. And so I wanted to ask you, um, starting with you, Dillman, what was your, what did you want us to focus on with the story that you just read? Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think with me, uh, a lot of what I publish are short stories, but uh, I think in the world we consume more short stories than we know. Because I think of films, I make films as well, but I think of films as short stories because they can be consumed in one sitting. And it's for this reason I don't really like serials, uh, TV series, because you know they never end. But um, with a short story, it, it kind of feels, um, even, even, even with the writing, even with writing it, like I remember writing this one that I've read in one sitting. I started, I think, in the morning. By 4 p.m. it was finished, but it's about 5,000 words. Um, yeah, there, there, there is a way, like, uh, you know, it's a very busy world. And so just 
sitting down and, and, and putting the story and, 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 and you get it out, you know. It, 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 all, it all comes like in, in one go. And I don't have to go back to it and try to get the structure right and, and, and all that. So when, when, when I'm doing the story, I, I normally think of stories like, I know people consume a lot of short stories, whether it is films, whether it is graphic novels, whether it's an audio something, but there's a lot of short story that is being consumed. And so I try to uh, make the, <laughs> yeah, like I imagine, okay, this person is going to take an hour reading this and it's probably also going to be an hour watching a film. So pretty much that will be what I'll, yeah, try to yeah. pack into that. Mm. I w so as a follow-up, what did you, in that um, story that you wrote, the one that you just read from, what did you want that reader to take away in that hour, half an hour that they spend with your story? What did you want your reader to take away? Uh, the story is about, uh, yeah, it's about many things. I don't even remember what it was about, but it's about a boy. <laughs> Uh, it's about a boy who kills his mother accidentally and then he's banished from the village. But he's not a boy. I, okay, it's spoiling the story if I tell you everything. But then it's really, okay, maybe it's a story about grief, basically. He's just grieving his mother and he, what he did led to his mother's death and it led to his banishment from the village. Though at the end of the story, you realize he's not actually a human child, but he is, uh, he is something. Okay, you don't have <laughs> to give it away. But I want to ask you, um, I think what I'm trying to get at is, what did you want um, the reader to take away um, from the story about grief? And why did you choose to, to tell the story in the way that you did? Yeah, I, I don't know if I really wanted the reader to take anything. I just wanted people to enjoy. <laughs> and to enjoy. Yeah, it. To yeah. Be so it's, yeah, yes. it's, the, it's the thing that I was talking about. You know, you're watching a film. Most of the time, of course, you'll go to a cinema and say, oh, yes, I want to be empowered, you know, by this or that. But <laughs> most of the time, it's like, where's the popcorn? Let's sit and enjoy it. <laughs> That's yeah. right. I love that. We're going to talk about that some more. Um, but um, I, I want to know from you what did you want um, the reader to take away from reading Fulbright? Well, I think Fulbright, like a lot of the short stories that I enjoy writing are also similar to a lot of the short stories that I enjoy reading in the sense that their brevity contains a longer narrative from which they're plucked. And it is hoped, is it not working? Yeah. yeah. And it is hoped that through the writing or the reading of, uh, of Fulbright and, this short, uh, and any other short stories that you get a sense of the news of the world, that there's a longer narrative that the short story is not dealing with because of its bre uh, brevity, because of its shortness. And in that short moment of experiencing and reading that story, that you're able to transport a reader through time and place using your craft and skill. You don't have 100 pages to do it, you only have five. That requires, for example, then a high level of skill in order to transport you immediately and immerse you in a different geography or time or situation. And I think that's what I enjoy with short story writing. With Fulbright specifically, for me, it's a story about how often some of the things that we prize and that are supposed to bring you a higher status wind up being poisoned in a way because this boy wins this Fulbright scholarship. Everybody knows how prestigious that is. And he goes to this very prestigious university in New York. And although on paper it looks like it's a very big very big win for him. This thing winds up disrupting um, his, uh, his personal life, his relationship with his then girlfriend in the story, and then also his relationship with his friends. Because as with, you know, with Fulbright scholarships, only a handful of people get them. And when you're in a comparative environment, your friends might be applying for them, and how does that affect you when one of them gets it, but the others don't? So those are the things that Fulbright, in a nutshell, deals with. Yeah. yeah. So I wanna, um, I'll, I'll bring it back to you, Dillman. So why did you um, choose to sort of present the story the way that you did? And I know and we're gonna talk more just about general short stories, but I'm really curious about um, the excerpt that you read. Why did you choose, um, because you only have a few pages and a few you know, thousand words to present this bigger idea um, or to entertain us, why did you choose to sort of start there start where you did and, and, and craft the story in the way that you did? Um, 
Okay, the story opens when the child or the, is descending into the valley where rivers go to die. Uh, I think, you know, with a short story, you don't have to, uh, you, when, when you're writing a short story, you don't get bog, bogged down by um, backstory or a lot of backstory. So it's, it's more like a film because you're watching an action thing and it starts there. They call it inciting incidents. I, I don't use that when I'm doing short stories, but as an analog, you know, you, you have to follow something from point A up to the point it ends. And you need the, the reader's attention like quickly and, and so that they don't wander away. Because with a novel, you can start from point Z, I mean point X, and then you come to point C, and then you go back to point <laughs> Z. And because there is time, you know, you have the reader for a month, maybe. It's not, it's not in one sitting. But then, um, so writing short stories, I, I, I just think of the single action, like the point of attention that is going to, like the one thing that is going to be the main character's focus. And uh, I didn't know this until somebody reviewed my books and was like, this guy writes from a very, their third person narrative, but it feels like one, a, a first person narrative because it's from a very narrow point of view. And I realized, who oh, I actually never leave the point of view of the main character at all. Um, I think maybe 99% of the stories I've written are like that. But it's because I want uh, the, the attention to be on one thing, one person, and not wander away um, into other things, and, and not get bogged down the, re the reader with backstories, with explanations of what happens and all that. But I think the, by the end of the story, uh, you'll know what kind of creature this boy is, you'll know what he did, and you'll know what his punishment is and all that, but it comes in very like uh, broad strokes of yeah, one line here, one line there to give a picture. But then I try to focus just on the moment, like he's getting into the valley and what he finds in the valley and he gets out of the valley and that's it. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, thank you. Because it's, it's very affecting because you sort of drop us into the middle of holding a leg, um, shattering, um, wanting to, you know, also die. I mean, there's, there's so much there that sort of pulls at you and tugs at you that does um, keep our attention. So, you, success. Um, but I'll, I'll ask you, so why did you choose, I mean, you're, you're telling us about like, you know, this, this win for this, this um, your protagonist, um, but then you're sort of showing how um, it impacts his life in sort of unexpected ways. Why did you choose to be, t tell the narrative from the plane? Um, I think because of where I come from. I, l I live in Vintuk, in Namibia, where Azuki Swa has incorrectly stated there are only two writers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's quite a handful now. Um, the reason why I was particularly uh, drawn to this type of narrative is because of the way elsewhere is very magnetic to people from where we come from. Um, to get a Fulbright to go abroad is a thing that changes your status forever. Any of them actually, Fulbright, Chevening, Commonwealth, all of these things, you come back with a different status, you get to swagger over your local compatriots who studied locally. It's like a very big thing. Um, the reason why though is because that narrative, the journey towards competing for these prestigious prizes actually has a larger commentary about the way we see ourselves, how we see foreign education institutions, what we value, so you could study international relations somewhere in the US or the UK, I could do it in Vintuk and we would not have the same opportunities. It's actually more of a comment about what we value um, about elsewhere and what we devalue about home. But the reason really is, I think it was like all the things that I enjoy writing, again, like the things I enjoy reading, have to have some degree of novelty to them for me as the reader and as that I experience. And that's what I really try to bring to the work. And I think that's why the short story worked for this. I wouldn't have the stamina of the skill to drive this over a longer narrative. But I do think for this particular short story, um, I had all the necessary ingredients to compile something that was riveting, captivating. 
I'm not sure who it is, but they say short stories are like a love affair, a steamy love affair in the Ghanaian heat. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, you're here for a good time, not for a long time. So you try and, you try and put in as much... Into <laughs> Yeah, you put in, you put in, a, you put in, you, you do put in a lot of effort into it because you know it's fleeting. And I think that's one of the gifts of short stories because they, they end. But you think about them for a very, very long time when they are good and when they are meaningful. Um, and that, I think, is the reader experience from, um, my reading experiences from short stories uh, as opposed to novels in some kind. The writing and the craft needed to, comp to compose both is still very high, but the reading experience is a little bit uh, yeah. different. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'll just um, piggyback um, with you because, you know, your 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 novel, um, the Eternal Audience of One, and you you've written and you also um, edit uh, a, 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 a literary uh, magazine as well. So talk to us a little bit about the difference in craft between you know, writing a novel versus writing a short story and even editing short pieces for your literary journal? Um, with regards to the craft of writing short stories or novels, I'm not sure, I don't think there's a, a big difference in the craft. Um, regardless of whichever medium you're doing, you're working it, you have to be very good at, you have to be a very good storyteller, you have to have a good command of whatever language you're working in, regardless of, in. Uh, regardless of the tradition you're in. So if you're writing in Gikuyu, you have to know the Gikuyu language very well. If you're writing in English, you have to know English very well. Uh, if you're writing in Patois, you have to know Patois very well. And then you have to be a good storyteller. By a good storyteller, I always think of like those kids on the, ground, on the playground who were sometimes or oftentimes poorer than everyone else, but they told stories that were out of the world because they were like trying to get, win a status for themselves. And those kinds of kids who like had these otherworldly imaginations just were funny, as a, not as a, as a need, but as a, need, uh, as a way of defending themselves in the playground, because funny kids don't get bullied. Or gossips, uh, people who really know how to weave narrative and captivate people. That's what I think makes for good storytelling craft. When it comes to the short story and the novel, I think for me, that comes down to time, duration. Uh, my novel took me like a year and a half to write, but a short story didn't take me that long, even though I can spend a year and a half working on a couple of short stories or just crafting and recrafting one. Not continuously for a year and a half, but on and off. So for me, it's about the time commitments involved in one rather than the level of craft because the eternal audience of one was just as hard to write as Fulbright, just as it was hard to write the give of nicknames. It's all for me, it's all the same thing. It just depends on time. Yeah, yeah. for sure, novels take a long time. Um, talk to me a little bit about the experience of the anthology, because we're talking about um, consuming short stories in, um, in one sitting, right? Um, so when you have an anthology, which is a collection, um, how do you sort of um, approach putting together an anthology or, or participating in one? Um, I think anthologies for me, they they, they are great because of um, they focus. I, I, like some most of the anthologies I've been part of, uh, they have a certain theme. Like there was this anthology I was in, one of the very first called African Monsters, and it was like, oh, just write about a monster <laughs> from you know somewhere in Africa. And I remember writing a story particularly for these people, and I, I, I had to go back to the monsters I encountered as a child, and then wrote something about that, which was kind of refreshing. Um, yeah, like a great many of the anthologies that, because I do work mostly in science fiction uh, genres, they, there are now a lot of names for it, Afrofuturism, African Futurism, all those Futurisms, you know? <laughs> and. <laughs> Most of the time, they will be like, okay, we are doing only science fiction, and it has to be hard science fiction, which means uh, you can't put your ghosts in it. It has to be something that a scientist somewhere can look at and say, oh, yeah, this is possible. And so, yeah, it, it, it challenges, because, yeah, it, it's a challenge in, in that way. I remember this one that I wrote, uh, it was during, you know, the Ken Prize up there, 
workshops, the mm. annual thing, and then, so it was supposed to be a cross between literary and speculative. I, I don't know, yeah, I was playing li in those gray areas, and yeah, so it was also a challenge because I was like, okay, the audience who are going to read this are not really the guys who are going to get robots and spaceships and uh, those kinds of things. And so I had to package it in a way that, you know, somebody like Zuki can read without getting lost. <laughs> That's a good, I actually want to follow up and ask both of you, do you write differently when you know your work is going to be in an anthology versus, or, or yeah. yeah? Just to, what he said about anthologies is very, very, very correct. And I mean, you published uh, Relations, which is like the coolest mixtape of like African diaspora voices. That's one of the gifts of anthologies because they collect writers from different geographies to compile something that has a thematic connection, however vague or strong that connection might be. And so the anthology is often like uh, a slice of like different voices or stories from different places and times uh, because it realizes, I think an anthology knows that it's not in, it doesn't have the time to delve into something minutely, so it offers the best parts, the best highlights, and I think that's one of the gifts of anthologies. Um, and when someone like, for example, an editor like you says, Remy, hey, would you like to contribute to this anthology? The first sensation is always like, heck yes. The second is like you panic because you don't know who else is gonna be in the anthology. And so, yeah, you do tend to write, not, I, I tend to write a little more competitively, but you don't know who else is gonna be in the anthology unless you have like the inside school, but, which is very rare. But you often, I, not you often, I often think I try to elevate my craft a little more because I really do want to not only stand out, but also um, help, uh, if you're in an anthology together, all of your works, can't drag that anthology down. So you all want to collectively elevate the anthology. And so I mean in this one, um, when I got it, I was really, really floored because there's like great names in here. You have Aisha Haruna Atwa who's here, Atta who's here, you have Chik Chike Franke Dozian who's here, you have Edwidge Rainer Roll, you have like an incredible list of names featured in here. So when you are published in this kind of anthology, it's also a way of like seeing who an editor thinks your peers are, which can sometimes mm. be a validating experience. Mm. Yeah. Mm. That's interesting. Um, let's talk about that for a second, because there is this sort of competitiveness among us as writers. And when you're sort of put together side by side with your contemporaries or maybe writers that you admire, um, how do you handle that? How do you, how do you handle sort of being um, sort of especially considering the fact that um, as African writers, we're often just sort of like lumped into this like amorphous blob of Africanness, whatever that means to the outside world. And um, so how does it feel to sort of be in a collection that is touted as African and diaspora voices or African this or how does it feel? For me, uh you know, the difference between African and African diaspora voices just has to do with a uh, geography about where you find yourself in the world and whatever administrative processes you have to go through to make a living. Whereas you can be abroad and still have an African voice and still in your head deal with African issues and your stories still come from home back on the continent. Being included in this anthology specifically, but also in others, um, I always feel uh, that if my work makes it to that stage, uh, I'm adding something valuable and unique, which is why, for example, I take anthology writing seriously, not more seriously than anything, but it's like they're asking you to add something unique and you're probably the only one with this perspective. So I pay perhaps a little more attention to what the story or the writing carries because it's gonna be received somewhere else in the world. It's gonna be like, hmm, this is what writers from Vintok are saying. <laughs> I, don't want to, <laughs> I don't want it to, to be the only voice, but if it is, by, un, by some um, bad luck, gonna be the only one. I want to say something that I think is true. Yeah, how do, how do you feel about that? Um, I think with me, it's not about competitiveness. It's more about, you know, a sense of belonging. Um, like the, the area I work in, uh, you know, it's very genre fiction. It's more 
there's a lot of collaborations that happen, you know, in these kind of things. And sometimes uh, it, it, like, in an anthology, they normally mix the writers. If the publisher knows what they're doing, they'll put uh, well-established writers with writers who are just coming out uh, with those who are in their middle, whatever. So getting an anthology, you get a wide range of, you know, voices in the thing. And uh, for me, it's, it's always a good thing because, you know, we are based in the continent and the anthologies I've been with, which have like some of the biggest names in science fiction. And I'm like, oh yeah, cool. So people will buy the anthology, going to read uh, somebody like Nedi, who is already a, a celeb, and then they say, oh, there's also Dillman in this thing. And, and that's, that's, that's normally a good, a good thing. But also, other than anthologies, there's a new trend in publishing. I see it mostly in the science fiction thing, where they do story bundles. Mm -hmm. But this is mostly just for selling. It's not the, and, and they, the, the, either a publisher or a bookseller will collect books that are already, most, most of them are, are short, like novellas. I know this because one of my novellas participated in a story bundle sale um, earlier last year. And again, they put my novella with a lot of other people's novellas. And all of a sudden, in Goodreads, where I had only three reviews, I had now 30 reviews, I was like, hmm, wow. that's good. So yeah, there's always that exposure that you get in being in an anthology. And it's kind of like a chain effect. Somebody reads you, your short thing, and then they bother to find more about you. In the other thing. Mm. Uh, just on the competitive aspect, uh, Dillman said it feels like more like belonging, which I agree with, but when you're in Nana, uh, in your in your relations anthology, it's comforting, obviously, and you feel like you belong because you've already dealt with issues of like competitiveness beforehand. It's very competitive to be in your anthology because you, as the editor, whoever you've been reading, you've handpicked a few and said, "I think these are the best voices." Those voices are obviously competing against others who are not selected. So anthologies. I think, yeah, it's competitive to get into them because the editor who compiles them has to decide who's going to be in it. And so the writing world is uh, competing for anthology space or being included in a collection or prize thing. It's not as, uh, I, don't, I don't want people to feel like, oh, it's all, we all together. No, it's, it's ruthless. It's, it's, it's writers ruthless. are competitive. It is a competitive form of art because there are few writers. You have a limited budget to put this together. Uh, and you have to compile who you think the voices are who are going to carry narratives. It's, it's very competitive out there. I mean, I've, this year I was lucky enough to judge the Commonwealth Show Story Prize, and the writers there are not, they're not writing for a sense of belonging. They're writing because they believe they're the best. And you can see that in the writing itself. They are, they are trying to get their voices and their work out, and I respect that. Yeah. yeah. Let's talk about um, career when yeah. it comes to anthology, because you mentioned something, um, Dillman, about the fact that you know when your work is sort of put against or put in, in not against, but sort of in community with other writers, some who are better known um, than you may be, um, that sort of helps, it, it, it elevates you because you're sort of spoken of in the same um, breath, but at the same time, um, it also um, it widens the audience for your work. Have you seen, I mean, you, you gave us some examples of, you know, appreciably um, the ways that you've seen your, uh, more interest in your books or, or wider, being wider read. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about how you um, factor in your career and your sort of goals as a, as a writer um, with sort of deciding to participate in an anthology? Um, yeah, I, I think like when I look at my publishing record, I've published more in anthologies than in magazines. Uh, but why I said it, it gives a sense of belonging because 90% um, of those were invites. Like, oh, they, we, we, need, we are doing a science fiction collection, so we need uh, and, and, and normally, of course, by the time they're inviting you to submit a, an, an anthology, you're, you're somewhere in your thing. Of course, they're not going to invite somebody who is you know, totally unknown or something like that. So some of the anthologies have been invited to like this, the best science fiction of the year, which is 
uh, done by Clark. And like it's one of the biggest anthologies, like, like one of the most prestigious anthologies in, um, in the science fiction genre. So every year people look out for the best science fiction of the year and they say, oh, these were the best in, you know, the whole year. And, and, and of course, it, it does help with your career. And if you put it in your bio that, yeah, my story was in this, then um, other people, like they take more notice of you if, than if you are. So um, I don't know, publishing in magazines, uh, because in, in the science fiction genre, like it's either magazine or anthologies before you go to novels. Some people, of course, go and do novels, but it's, it's now much, um, it's, it's much easier to get a short story out than a novel. And like there's a bigger hunger for short stories, there's a bigger hunger for, yeah, yeah for short stories and anthologies and novellas. Um, and so career-wise, I get a lot more people asking me to send in short stories. And somehow I think what has gone wrong that this guy always has a short story <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> so they always ask him, do you have anything new? And I'm like, yeah, there is one. <laughs> Do you, and I send, do, you mm. do, do you sort of have a lot banked for, for, for that reason? Or um, each time, because you mentioned that you did uh, 5,000 words in one sitting. Do you, is that how you generally write? Yeah, pretty much. That's awesome. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Please give him a round of applause for 5,000 words that are good. <laughs> I, think, I, think when you, I think when you're Dillman and you have the, the body of work that he has, it's very, not very easy, but it is a lot simpler and quicker for you to get work out because the name has a reputation attached to it. But is it easier to get short stories out than novels? It really depends on what type of magazines you're gonna get into, trying to get into. Some have more so-called prestige attached to them and it's harder to get into those. Um, and you know, kudos to people who can write short stories very quickly and get them out. Uh, but the platforms that publish uh, short stories are not always um, open when you're ready to submit. They are also very, very competitive to get into, which again comes back to competitive writing. Obviously, when you get published in, in the end, it makes you feel good, but it is very hard to get into very good literary magazines, and I think with good cause. Um, so for me, when you ask the question about the career, I take short stories very, very seriously because short stories, a short story is the reason is how I got my book published. It, it's, I, got, I published a short story in an American magazine called American Cordata, issue six, June 20, 2019. And I got a random message on Instagram saying, hey, this is Cecile, I saw your short story in American Cordata, your bio says you have a manuscript, can I see this manuscript? So I take short story writing very seriously because that's how I got discovered. And I'm wondering whether that could work for a lot of other people. This is one of the motivating ideas behind Duke Literary Magazine in getting Namibian writers and those from Africa and the African diaspora writing short stories. And then hopefully among these voices, you might find gems. So the, the fact that you know, you, if you ask in terms of career-wise, I was made a lot by short stories being published, also being shortlisted for awards, winning the Commonwealth, that kind of thing. So I take that very seriously because it's a viable path to participating in literature. Poetry is one path, novels are another. There's so many ways, but for me to continue and participate, short stories were the way. So I have like the utmost respect for like the, the, the genre and the craft, yeah. Absolutely. Um, tell us about Doke. Tell us about how you, um, as a writer, edit other writers, and how do you choose, um, given how um, powerful the platform yeah. it is, how do you choose what? what? Uh, so Duke Literary Magazine is a, is a literary mag from Namibia that is always two weeks away from closing. Um, <laughs> it's, we've got 13 days before they decide to close the next one. Um, and what it does, it publishes fiction, nonfiction, poetry, and visual art from Namibia, Africa, and the African diaspora. The reason why we have these categories is because for a long time we felt like we were broadcasting from Pluto and nobody was hearing us. And so we realized one of the best ways to not only get our work out is to join our compatriots on the African continent in storytelling. So we publish them alongside together. Um, and also to inform ourselves about what writers in Ghana or Kenya or, you know, CAR are doing. We still haven't had one from CAR, but we're hoping. Um, we want to have these synergies 
happening in our magazine. It's absolutely, for me, as, an, as, as someone who's still a relative newbie in this industry, to be, uh, to, to, to edit confidently is something that I'm learning and I'm working at. But I know it takes a lot of time, often to the detriment of my own writing, because I want these writers who come through the magazine to have a platform that actually elevates their work. I don't want to have a terrible literary magazine. And so we work, we spend a lot of time in crafting and editing our stories because we think we owe it to the writers uh, to have a platform that pushes their work further than we can. Uh, and so we hope that you know whoever reading the literary magazine is always paying attention to some of the unique voices that are existing in Namibian literature, but also from the continent elsewhere. Um, I think the best thing I've ever learned from editing so far is never tampering with someone's voice to the point that it's not their own. I've made that mistake only once, and it's a lesson Troy and Yango taught me, and I think it's one that I've carried with forever, and I think it's one of those that I'm so eager to pay forward when a writer sees their work back and it's like, oh, this is me, but polished better, not my voice has been changed and those kinds of things. And so um, not only does Duke publish our work, we also curate uh, other people's literary magazines as well. We always vocal about uh, sharing other literary magazines work because it takes, literally takes our whole community to put African literature on the map. So people like Tro Nyango, who's here, who's the editor-in-chief of Lolloway, has been like <laughs> instrumental. Yeah, has been instrumental in not only in Lolway's success, but in Duke's success. Because remember, we're broadcasting from Pluto. We need somebody on Mars to spread the word <laughs> to Earth, and so Lolway is a lot closer to the sun. And yeah. so for us, to piggyback off that success is really important, and to pay that back to the community, because now we realize we might be in from Pluto, but there's someone behind us. Yeah. And so we're paying that message forward, uh, paying that favor forward as well. Yeah. Very true. Um, I want to um, open it up to the yeah audience. I see your hand up, Zuki. Please. <laughs> um, I think uh, this question is for Remy. One of the more interesting things that you do with Duke is the oral graphs from the different African cities. What's led you to want to actually do something like that? Yeah. Um, oral graphs is a term that we coined, or rather I coined about uh, experiencing a city in Africa from a sound perspective, uh, in which we ask our writers to go out into the world, wherever they happen to be, and they record a minute, two minutes, three minutes of sound from a place with an interesting um, set of acoustics or harmonics, so like a market or outside a nightclub or the, the sitting on the shore of Lake Malawi. And then the writer basically re, uh, con uh, connects that sound with something in their life about why they chose that thing. And the oral graphs have been absolutely amazing and well received. They're some of our uh, most read articles in the magazine because they transport you to another place in this strange way. You're reading and listening to this other writer's country or place or where they currently find themselves. And that for us is just another way to experience literature. And again, this is another lesson that you learn from other lit mag editors. This is another one I picked up from Troy. Actually, I think we're a subsidiary of like Lolo at this point. <laughs> uh, uh, is he's, he posited this question like, if you can experiment and there's no risk attached to it, why not, why not try it? So we, we tried it and it's been successful. And I think it's something that we've been very keen to continue this experimenting nature. There's no rules that you can't do this thing. And so we are very keen on trying not only this, but trying other things in the future. Yeah. Absolutely. Anybody else have any questions from the audience? Yes. Uh, my question is to both of to, to both of them. Uh, please show me the money. <laughs> That's the question. No, no, it's it's, it's uh, Are you asking about like contributor fees or remunerations or? Because to me, that's a question about literary about remunerating writers. 
Uh, no, the question is, um, I mean, you've had your magazine for many moons. Yeah. I think you're on edition seven or six. Uh, we're now, pro 13 will be due in December. So we've so been around since August so 2019. You're, you're yeah. already past the 10th edition. Yeah. So how are you able to survive? How are you able to make the, how, are you paying the writers? Yeah. How yeah. are you surviving? Because yeah. I'm assuming that you, unless you come from a very rich family, then please don't <laughs> answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and the same goes to you, Dilman. Uh, um, <laughs> is this a hobby? Uh, how are you doing this? Yeah, yeah. You go first. <laughs> yeah, um, I think I think in genre fiction it's a bit different because the money for short stories is really good. Um, on average, yeah, you Give write about robots. You'll see. Can you? Can you <laughs> Can you tell us, can you give us an example? Okay, it's not good that I can leave off it alone, but I mean, compared to, you know? You don't yeah. have to speak personally, but no, no, generally. No, like, no, generally, what, what's a, how much would generally, you pay for a short you know, story? In, uh, there, are, there are pro rates, there are semi pro rates, and then there are amateur rates. So, amateur rates, on average, they will pay you 25 to $50 for a story. And then the semi-pro rates, I forget the rates, but it's per word. Uh, and then there is the pro rate, which is eight cents per word. Okay. And yeah, if you get into the big ones, uh, they normally will charge, they will pay you per eight cents per word. So if you're doing 3,000 to 5,000 words, you'll find yourself sometimes in the region of $400, 200, 300 okay. per short story. Of course, you, you're you not going to sell a short story every month, but at least there is, you know, that kind of thing. And that's like two million dollars. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, you can pay rent of, yeah. of selling I, yeah. a short story. That's right. That's, that's yeah. yeah. That's right. I think, again, okay. Dillman uh, probably exists in like a sphere of skill that I have not yet reached because um, short stories, uh, when the remuneration arrives, it's more like a, perhaps a, a token sum of appreciation because it doesn't really go towards alleviating any cost associated with writing. For the literary magazine, as James asked, um, how Duke survives is uh, by being able to curate a successful literary platform. Like with any artistic endeavor, sooner or later, some corporate interest shows are trying to get something from that community of people. And so our awards are sponsored by one of the biggest banks in Namibia. The money, they prov the naming rights for the awards help to fund the writing, uh, to remunerate our writers and pay off our editors. This is not sustainable because you don't know how long these corporate interests will be around. Uh, but you do your best to be diplomatic and butter up and everything every year. But it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not, it's not, co it's, it, you can't take it for granted that it'll be there next year. So there's always a little bit of anxiety about whether they will renew the naming rights. Obviously we are, our arts organization, Duke, which, I, which I'm the chairperson of, we have a patron, we have a set of trustees who are much smarter than me and who have hectic degrees who for pomp and circumstances are in charge of fundraising and that helps because nobody will give money to an artist, but they will give money to bankers and lawyers. So we have a trust, uh, a board of trustees who have these expertise on them. And so that's how w one way we're able to survive. But um, there's been a couple of times where things have been dicey and I've asked my wife to start selling foot pictures on OnlyFans because it's for <laughs> literature. Um, anything for literature, it's time to, <laughs> it's time, when it's time to pay writers, when it's time to pay artists, when it's time to keep our literary magazine going, I think that's important. You have to do what you have to do. Um, <laughs> But with that said, with the money, if the money were to run out and worst comes to worst and, we'll be and we have to shut it up, as so many lit mags have shut it, I don't know what we do at that point. It hasn't happened, but I know it happens for a lot of literary magazines, which is why I always say it's two weeks away from shutting down because of that uncertainty in the literary uh, right. environment that I'm working in. But I, I don't lament or feel sad whenever a literary magazine closes. Because every time one goes under, I know a small handful of editors are finally getting some sleep. <laughs> <laughs> finally. Very true, um, yes. One maybe just these. to add quickly. Oh, Can I add quickly? Yes. The, you know, the thing with uh, 
most magazines that I know of, most of these science fiction things, they are able to pay that because they are, like most of them have Patreons, they have patrons who contribute monthly fees. And I've also seen writers, I'm also on Patreon, like people, but mostly for the film, but I know writers who promise short stories, and so they've, they've gathered funds, and so funds, they're saying, oh, every month I'm giving you $5, or this, but as long as you keep giving us a short story every other time. So there, is, there are many ways that short stories are actually helping on, on the internet for uh, writers to get, but most of the magazines that I know of, they don't depend on sales, they depend on um, patrons, like people pledging monthly fees to keep them alive, and then they are able to pay writers really good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's one more question. Right. Can we? Do um, we have time for one? Yes. Yes, we do. Okay. Um, I happen to be the session manager, oh, so okay. <laughs> this is to my discretion. Uh, fantastic panel, by the way. My my question is simple. There's a common perception amongst writers that the story, the short story, is a stepping stone to a book or like a, a full-length novel and I wanted to see what you guys think about that. That's not necessarily, I don't think that's necessarily true that a sh short story is a stepping stone. There's people who've won very big and prestigious short story awards and not produced the same manuscript. There's also very, very talented novelists whose short stories should probably not have been let out of their draft folder. It's not, one is not, I don't think they're equal to the other, or one is lower than the other, or one is better than. I think they're just two different ways of applying the craft. Whatever that, might, perhaps that trend came from the industry in the way that you see this person was writing a series of short stories to support themselves, and they were being serialized or published in magazines while they were working on a novel, and so many people might have interpreted that as, oh, you have to write 10 short stories, publish them in, X, Y, and Z magazine, and then the novel will come after. That's not necessarily true. It is possible to just write short stories and release collections of short stories, and it is also possible to write novels and not do the other. But it is that thing that a short story is a stepping stone. I would, I would say you definitely have to try that at like what I would call an elite literary magazine and see if that thing works. Because the short story writers that are writing short stories I'm not treating that as a stepping stone. Mm -hmm. That is the goal by itself. It's very different to run 400 meters for fun and then 400 meters to run against someone who runs 400 meters. It's, the, it's just 100 meters is short, but it's not short when you're running against Usain, Usain Bolt. It feels <laughs> like a very, very long time. So for me, that statement doesn't hold water because I've seen people who've swaggered up to literary magazines and thought they would coast their way through the submission pool. And they thought, oh, I'm such and such and such working here and that and the other, fellowship, bread, loaf, what, what, <laughs> slash pile, <laughs> slash pile. Because they have, you, there's this perception that short stories are like a practice run, and they aren't. Not for the short story writers, not for the people who read short stories, but not for editors like Nana who spend a lot of time and effort putting anthologies together and most people don't realize this anthology is a book. It's not like a stepping stone for a novel. It's a book in itself. Yeah, yeah and maybe just to add, um, okay, they have clapped, so. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, what I was going to say is like, uh, for me, kind of, I'm being typed as a short story writer, and I'm getting more invitations to do short stories and novellas. I think I'm now on my third or fourth novella, I don't remember. Now I've published three novellas. Hopefully one will come out again next year. And novellas are normally in the short story, they are normally shorter fiction. Um, I think I'm going to stick to that a lot. I've been writing a novel since 2017, and somehow I've never managed to finish it. But <laughs> I feel your pain, it's hard, <laughs> it's hard. Um, hi, my question is for Remy. Yeah. And um, you talked about the sort of competitive nature of writing and how you judge the um, Commonwealth Short Story Prize and how you know people are really going at it. I'm very interested in your thoughts and your opinions on how that is affecting the quality or the, the quality of storytelling, right, that's happening right now 
and whether it affects the kinds of sort of narratives or stories that are coming out. Because there's often this thing where I've, I've, you know, I've heard about from people who've judged certain prizes that you know, once um, a prize, some, the, after a prize is won, the next um, call out, everybody's writing the same kind of story. Um, and so I'm interested in how sort of these competitions or these opportunities are affecting the kinds of stories yeah. that are being told. So I want to know from your perspective. Yeah. I think for me, the first thing to understand is that literature as an industry is not immune from things that happen in other industries. So if someone, a company, one company A releases a, a touchscreen phone, company B will release a touchscreen phone soon after because they see its demand and its success. So if I can definitely tell you when Jennifer McCombie published uh, and won for Let's Tell the Story Straight, the next submission window there was Let's Tell the Story Better. <laughs> <laughs> an improvement because literature is still an industry so people are banking and gambling on the fact that if this story has this reception maybe mine can coast along the same way but that's not necessarily true because the judges change every year they have different aesthetic palettes um, I they, they have different considerations and so that's a risky uh, approach to take when writing short stories again the, when I say competitiveness I often mean it in terms of the language that write, pe writers are using and the imagery and the metaphor they're reaching for. They are working very hard to make sure that their story set yes. in Lagos doesn't sound or look or feel like other stories set in Lagos. That's competitive writing, making sure that you're trying to stand out. And then you have very brave people from small literary traditions who they know, they just know they're the first writer ever to submit to this prize from this part of the world. And so you can just tell from reading it, this story's been in composition for a while, and when it comes, it seems near perfect. And that's what I mean by competitive. There's, there's very few of the stories that I read, for example, for this year's pool or for any of the other writers' uh, uh, prizes I've been lucky enough to judge, have that feeling or where that annoying thing writers say like, oh, I wrote this the night before. Nah, not at that level of writing, because submissions are open now, you best believe someone has been thinking about the story for a year ago. And I think that is, is the most important thing to remember. My opinions are, again, I think that co writing is competitive. There's limited space. I don't have a kumbaya approach when I write stories, but I'm very kumbaya when I'm reading because I'm in a different state of mind. But if I'm trying to get into Lolwe, I am definitely not trying to let Dillman take my place. That's <laughs> what I mean by competitive. I've got nothing against him. My story is going to be different from his. But I'm trying to look at my mistakes and trying to make them better, look at my story and ask myself, is this worth an editor's time? And if so, if it gets to that editor, is it worth the reader's time? And those kinds of artistic considerations are where I think are important for writers to make because it, it is complete. There's very limited space. And yes, there is a lot of mirroring. So yeah, I did see one story that almost sounded like the granddaughter of the octopus, which is my short story, because maybe they saw, oh, Remy's a judge, maybe he'll write the same story that he wrote, but it doesn't, doesn't work that way, because thankfully there's a pool of people who dilute your particular aesthetic, and other people defend other positions. Uh, but competitiveness, I think, comes out in the uniqueness of stories. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Remy. Thank you, Dillman. I actually, I, I thank you. I actually don't have a question, but I just want to say a big thank you to our own Nanaikwa Bruhamon. One of the wonderful things, if you could just hold that up, please, the Relations Anthology. Um, it is, yes, I'm in it, but this isn't about me. <laughs> this is about Nanaikwa Bruhamon using her power, using her relationships, and making sure that there were a whole trove of African stories for the next generation. So thank you so much for putting this work together. Thank you for finding writers that many of us might not have gotten to. And thank you for sticking with it and having this book published. And please, if you don't have one, yeah. Media Books is right there. Yeah. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for uh, contributing. Wrap up, Remy. I only have one last thing to say about uh, the anthology that you put together. It was so wonderful when we finally got it because it was a lot of work. And the power of anthologies, I think I said this earlier, is that it curates a lot of voices in one small space. 
we've never had this for ourselves in Vintook. And so for the first time after like two years of like hard work, thanks to like a lot of support from a lot of people, but also working with people like you, uh, Duk now has its very first anthology, which uh, curates voices from Namibia, South Africa, Eswatini, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. It's like the first in the country's history, and it'll be on sale very soon, so you're hearing the word first here in Accra. Yeah. Congratulations. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think the panel is over. Yes, thank you all so much for being in attendance for your brilliant questions. Thank you for your brilliance, your work um, that you've contributed. Um, it was so easy chatting with you, so thank you. And um, please buy books. Thank you. And buy them and get them signed. Lots of books, lots of reflections. I'd like to thank the panel for a great job done. No, no, thank you. Remy and Dilman, thank you. Now from the anthology, we'll go to music and the novel, which will be the icing on the cake.
Kalanga and Ni Aikwe Parks, the specialists in literature. <laughs> to be politically correct. So we're going to have fun with music and the novel telling our own story in verse 2. We can tell stories in all kinds of uh, ways. There are different genres of treating literature. We just had a huge discussion about long form, short form, but all writing is hard work. All writing is hard work. It's fun, but it's a lot of work. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Ni Ayikwe Parks, as well as Tala Epalanga. Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, hi. How are you doing, me? <laughs> um, I wouldn't say we're specialists, well, speaking for myself, at writing or music. We're specialists at exploration. Absolutely. Right? We're trying to make sense of life, still. Um, <laughs> and um, and we, we're, we're happy to have you here. We're just going to talk a little bit about storytelling and music and um, lots of randomness. Yeah, um, I think what would be really interesting is if you tell how we first met. <laughs> if you remember, <laughs> this is the furthest I've ever yeah. sat away from you. You know that. Yes. I feel bereft. <laughs> we should. We can. <laughs> the cameraman will will freak out if we rearrange the room. Yeah. Um, I will ask a favor on the, you know, people on the sound. Can you put some high on, the, on my voice? Otherwise, I will ask for pillows to be distributed. Everybody <laughs> will fall asleep. <laughs> you know, because I think this is a very serious, still daytime. You know, we don't need to go, you know, that, on that, on that we, not, we don't need to move to This is a level. man who knows the hypnotic quality of his own voice. <laughs> <laughs> we, I remember, I have flashes of our first meeting. Mm. Definitely involved food, music, and going out in Lisbon. Yes, indeed. I have a picture, but I think that was the second time we met on a in a club. I the second a time was in the club. The first time yeah. was in a bar. In a bar. I mean, so <laughs> <laughs> it's apples and oranges. That's why I have flash. <laughs> I have flash <laughs> moments, not exactly like uh, a um, linear time. Yeah, I ask because, of course, I think those places, the bar, the club, are reflective of the spaces within our novels, our, our recently released novels, um, Wise Can Dance to and Asuka. Um, they revolve around food and the culture of food and music and um, just the movement of the body. Yes, people moving from one place to the other. Yeah. It's, I, I have to, to say that everybody should read this novel because we're mainly here to sell books. That's no, very no, important. This is, this is how it's supposed to be. It turns your world upside down. <laughs> <laughs> my, my apologies. Yes. Asuka. It's a, it's a novel that I would say, beside the, the topic of music and food and community, I believe um, there is this um, claiming of the word ecology. Because when we, when we think ecology or nature, preserve, and which is very in vogue currently, we rarely see that on the on African um, perspective, through an African perspective. Because I believe our forefathers, our ancestors, they they didn't do mass agriculture. It was very seasonal, very understanding uh, the, the, the power of the land, what the land can provide. And I think that's, in a way, is also related to rhythm, mm -hmm. to music, to sound, to poetry. And your novel beautifully touched on that topic. Thank I think you. even like, it passed the word ecology, it goes really into, into the idea of nurturing mm. and how we nurture the land and also how we nurture our bodies. 
Yeah, which, I mean, yeah. There's a way in which those things intertwine. And I think if you look at, in both of our books, we have a, a character who's a member of a band, right? And, and I think um, there's a kind of metaphor in a band ecology of you curating just the right people to make that right sound. And I think that in the old days, the way we cultivated food was about what we needed within our families, right? And so I, I think there's a parallel there. What I really love about the structure of your book, and again, guys, you need to read the book, is that I feel like it's structured um, a bit like a song, where you have verse and chorus. And I would say, I mean, so without giving anything away, one of them is in a holding cell. <laughs> one part of the novel happens in the holding cell, and the rest of the novel hap happens everywhere in the world, right? Um, and, I, and I love that we keep coming back to that. And it's almost like um, the world makes sense of the holding cell. But then in a way, and you focus very early, the reason why he's in a holding cell is because of the Angolan passport. How the Angolan passport as well, even when you're moving in the world, is a kind of imprisonment as well. Um, yeah, so d I, I find that really fascinating that you, you were able to do that while ostensibly talking about not just music, not just the band um, Sistema, which is... So, Kalaf's novel is part autobiographical in, in the sense that the, the band actually exists. It's a band that he led. And then a lot of it's fictional, but there are things I recognize. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I, I, w was that a deliberate thing to structure it that way to keep us there in the cell? is to yeah. keep us listening? I, I found it, that moment very interesting. I, I love stories that happen on a really short time, mm. and then you expand and just allow, almost like just allowing yourself, because our minds are, are distinct animals, you know? You cannot constrain mm. the, the mind. You can be here, you know, you could be making love to your wife and suddenly you're thinking about the football match. You know, mm -hmm. men do that very often, you know, so that we can last a little longer. So we, we drift <laughs> our minds. Sorry, I, I, I touch a nerve. <laughs> I apologize. So, I didn't want to expose anybody. That wasn't my intention. <laughs> We're talking about literature. Yeah. So <laughs> actually, you know what? I mean, I think we've entered this discussion about novels with a kind of short story energy where Everybody doesn't know where we're starting. It would be great to hear you read from your book just to, to situate give context. Yes. people in, in the world. Thank yeah. you for saving me, Ni. You are very kind. <laughs> I was thinking like I was in the, in the wrong panel <laughs> because that panel, uh, Wet Sulamine, be beautifully, um, and Nana, yes, and Aisha, of course. So I will read from the beginning because it gives a, a, a context. Yeah? Bear in mind, I'm not really a good reader in public, so I will do my best. Norway, 9th of August of 2008. When the guns turn meek, Kuduro will still speak because a voice makes bu bullets seem weak. Bruno M. Já respeita, né? I guess I must have got distracted by those Bruno M. lines because I didn't even register the bus slowing and parking on the side of the road amid a exuberant green. I didn't notice when crossed the Sylvain Soon Canal separating Sweden from Norway even over the new bridge built across the Edith Fjord and baptized with the same name as the old bridge, Sivnesund. I would have liked to sing in it, being my first time visiting the northern lands, but couldn't help falling asleep. We are under 13 kilometers south of Oslo and 180 kilometers north of Gothenburg where last night at the Way Out West Festival, 
a crowd of well-mannered blonde Swedes dance frenetically to our bland Kuduro house and tropical techno, as if it was the last August of their lives. And as if the cities of Luanda and Lisbon were not so distant and unknown. The door opened and two police officers, both in plain clothes with badges around their necks, boarded their vehicle. The man, tall and blonde the way only Vikings can be, introduced himself to the passengers. I don't recall the exact words, but my mind immediately went back to, the re to replay the practicized dozen of times, the words that I practiced a dozen of times, just in case I were to come across border officers at any point of the three and a half thousand kilometers I had covered since Lisbon. I was traveling without a passport, having lost somewhere in a hotel in Paris a few weeks earlier, a nightmare which at the time had forced my band, Buraca Sun Sistema, to cancel a series of engagements because, in addition, since misfortune always bring a plus one to the party, I'm an Angolan citizen. When you are an ordinary Angolan citizen, the last thing you want to lose is your papers. I would give anything for it to have been my phone, uh, the suitcase, my clothes, my laptop, just not the passport. As these men traveling back to Luanda, finding a handler, paying an expedite fee, and then praying to Kianda or Saint Iphigenia for her to bless the computers of the Angola Migration and Foreign Service for the system not to fail. And I prayed now. I prayed to Saint Elizabeth and to Saint Benedict that would not flatter. I pray to my voice to not fail me when my turn to present my papers would come. For the lie that I prepared for the occasion to come convincingly, but it did not. I showed my residence card and the blonde man looked at suspiciously and asked for my passport. I lied, saying I had it in my suitcase. The other officer, a brunette who looked like a um, who might be a professional judo player, joined us. Apparently, I was the only person, the only person on the bus with a sus suspect document. I'm sure no other foreigner with a residence card issued by the Portuguese Immigration and Border Service had ever crossed those borders before. The blonde man, who could easily have been in our audience on the previous night, asked me to fetch my passport. Entrust, entrusting the driver to open the luggage compartment. The two officers escorted me to my suitcase. And in those few meters, I even considered turning back and telling them the truth, confessing that the passport I had to show them was an old expired one, so devastated by the time that nobody in their right mind would ever allow me passage with a document in such condition. Not only had expired back when the Angolan revolutionary Jonathan Vimbi was still alive and wrecking havoc, but the space for the photograph was occupied by what now looked like more a painting by the, impress the impressionist master William de Kooning. My legs trembling, but with the most confident attitude I ever boasted, I held out the passport just like that, rotten face, as the Angolans say. And, and my bold and irresponsible gesture might have set every alarm on those two officers' heads. Only a madman, or really a first-class criminal, would attempt to cross the whole Europe by bus and train with the excuse that he was a musician from a Lisbon band and had a concert to perform at that, at that night at one of the most, confident, uh, most, most iconic festival of electronic music. I, would have, I wouldn't have believed myself 
if I was in their position. Sorry, my reading, I tried to do my best. <laughs> yeah, so this, this story don't, doesn't have nothing to do with the ability or the lack of, of white people on a dance floor. Just like, let's make that clear. No, it's absolutely true. Uh, I, I wrote this story and I place it on that moment because this episode is absolutely true. That's the only true fact on this book. I got arrested in Norway when I went to perform there and I lost my passport and all that that I described. It happened. While on that sale, of course, I, I was not thinking about music. I was just trying to get out of there as quickly as possible. But when I was on a festival in Brazil, uh, in an audience more or less uh, like this, before that uh, panel, I had been to Brazil twice. And every time I went to Brazil to perform, I performed to a majority white audience. Yeah? So for the first time in Brazil, I was in front of the 54% African descent that Brazil has. Yeah? The majority of the population is black in that country. So for the first time, I was talk talking to my siblings and they didn't know anything about me. They didn't know about my music, about the city of Luanda, what we were doing like on the contemporary context. The idea of Africa was very romantic. So I went through this ABC type of uh, role, explaining the type of music that I was doing, the type of culture that we, we were presenting to the world. So after that panel, the conversation was more or less the same as, as, as what we're doing here, yeah. but was with Agualusa, which, by the way, introduced us. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and Agualusa turned and said, you should write the biography of Kuduro, because the way you explained was so clear that people should know more about this music genre. And at the time, I was still touring, so I didn't have time to go back to Angola and chase musicians that don't want to be found. So I decided to, okay, let me pick up an episode and tell my relationship with this music. Why I was risking my life to perform to an audience that never saw me, never really visited my country, didn't know anything about my culture. And I think I will do the same, if yeah. you ask me. Yeah, and, and I think that kind of expresses what's really genius about the book is that it's, it's a biography of a music, but because music comes out of a society, it's also the biography of Angola yeah. to some degrees. And, and migration as well. Uh, migration, your own biography. And actually, what I also love is that there are, there's music in everyday life, right? And there's a passage I'm going to read from your book that I really love, which where you see kind of like the, the resonances in the music of everyday life in, in, a, in a standard urban you know, African city. What do you call those buses that you go on? Kandongero. Kandongero, okay, thank yeah. you. You helped me with my pronunciation here. So, the best way of drawing a true portrait of Angolan society is sitting inside a Kandongero. My aunt Beatrice used to tell me, who was herself a Kandongero driver, described by a TPA journalist as the only woman in a world dominated by men. My mother's youngest sister, Aunt Beatrice, who we called Tia Bia, was always a woman ahead of her time, or perhaps just another Angolan woman who was a mistress of the art of survival. In the 1980s, she was a soldier and a police officer. And in the 90s, she became the owner of a snack bar. In 2000, she took the wheel of a Kandongero. It was she who told me that the Kandongero business had started to become fashionable around 1986, when Luanda's traditional public transport was in decline caused by poor management, maintenance problems, and progressive deterioration of the streets. As the civil war in the country's interior intensified, Luanda became a place of refuge for those who were more affected. The city grew dramatically. The Museskis were expanding seemingly arbitrarily in total disorder, and the existing transport ne networks didn't cover the whole suburban area. Immediately, in, dis in obedience to the entrepreneurial spirit, anyone who had their own vehicle saw a business opportunity. Unlike most of the city's Kandongeros in which you could only hear Kuduru and Kizomba, the speakers of the Hayes, which we have in Ghana, we, we pray by the Hayes, um, driven by Tiabia, only played sambas 
from olden days, Sembas from olden days, Rui Mingas, Artur Nunez, um, David Zay, singers who gave voice to the Angolan people's aspirations, who sang our pain and our yearning for freedom. Blessed be they who sacrificed themselves and fought for change. I remember my, hearing my aunt saying, as if in prayer, when I was accompanying her on her favorite route from the airport to Balezao. Balezao? Balezao, yeah. A lot of kind of girls would drive packed to impossibility with the radio full volume and disrespecting all the traffic rules defined by the highway code. Benguelense, do you know that the history of transport here in Luanda is a perfect metaphor for understanding the Luandan people, she asked me, but gave me no time to reply. First came the owners of light vehicles who'd gotten tired of giving people lifts, so started charging 500 kwanza per ride. Those old kwanzas, the ones from back in the days of the one-party regime. But their cars, just like Luanda itself, started to get too small with the arrival of so many people. And so then came the flatbed trucks, still an Angolan classic today, where it's best we don't even count how many people get on them. There are many. It wasn't until the 1980s that you started to see the nine-seater minivans in circulation as taxis, the ones that came from Belgium, from Holland, and West Germany. You hear me, Kalaf? After those, it was almost the end of the 1980s before our Toyota High Aces started to invade our roads. Or those things we optimistically think of as roads, becoming the official vehicles for business. This thing can handle whatever you throw at it. Potholes, dirt tracks, lakes of rain, and most of all, the beatings you take on the road. There's no motor better suited to Luanda than a Toyota High Ace. It's like the Luandans, however worn out everything's gotten, with the road no better than a beaten earth track, they keep going. And then, it's the conductors who do have a voice, shouting the taxi's destination with the effectiveness and volume of the most committed stockbroker on the Wall Street Stock Exchange. But they don't call, buy, or sell. They're shouting, going to. Your destination yelled with lungs full of air, wherever, always announced quickly and twice over. Airport, airport, Mutamba, Mutamba. It's the conductors who take the Kwanzas for each route folding the banknotes in half between index finger and ring finger beneath the middle finger, thus forming a wad of bills that is neatly ordered by value. The conductor doesn't have a designated seat. I'll leave it there. Because I actually think the storyteller doesn't have a designated seat. Thank and you. that's Thank you, you in this book, and which, which gives such a rich tapestry of not just, I mean, Angola, yes, but you're very much a city boy. Very much. Very yes. much a city boy. And so that love comes through for Lisbon and Luanda, which is really interesting. And then the story of the music. Um, but I mean, obviously, you, you say Agualusa. So I met um, Jose Eduardo Agualusa actually at the first Brooklyn Book Festival, um, which was probably a decade ish ago or maybe more. Um, and randomly, because I was with a um, Cameroonian writer whose name has just left my head. Um, who knew him, and, and we just got talking in the way that you do in Babylon when you all want to go and find plantain somewhere and you can't find it. Um, and yeah, and I just kind of, we, j we just really just hit it off. And he's like, anytime you're in Lisbon, just, <laughs> just come and call on me. Yeah. So I then met his, his translator, who is your translator. Yes. So the interesting thing, when I'm reading your work, I know your voice and I can hear your storytelling in there. But there are hints there where I'm like, I can hear Danny as well. Very much. Th because he has yeah. such a great sense of the musicality of a, of a sentence. And he's trans yeah. so when he's translating into English, he kind of brings the Portuguese a little bit into it in a really funny way, yeah. um, which is a really beautiful thing. So I want to ask about, because this is about music, and language is also music, how does it feel for you reading your book in English? Now it's been you wrote it in Portuguese and it's been translated into English. Well, um, I have a panel on translation, so I'll try to not spoil it. I'm saving stuff for the other panel. Um, but I would say the working with a translator was interesting. For example, like you remember the message that you sent me yesterday? So, oh, your book changed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please send me the new version. Um, I took the opportunity to edit the shit out of this book. <laughs> Believe me, I, I went in. I was really shy until one moment, uh, my, my, my publisher at the time, she's now out of 
Faber. Uh, yeah, she asked like, oh, do you mind of uh, tweaking here and there? Because on the Portuguese version of this book, I'm more, let's say, anthropologist type of, uh, uh, because we, we, not, we, don't, we don't have a book like this in, in Portuguese literature, like writing about music, but not writing about music just for the sake of, oh, let me sprinkle some music here and there. Really just describe how music defines the fabric of the society. Everything we have, oh, sorry, someone is calling me. I apologize. <laughs> Sorry, sorry. Uh, really, it's, it's, it was really, um, for example, I, I have Kizomba a lot on this novel. And the reason why I put Kizomba and not so much Kuduro, and I have this dialogue between Kuduro and Kizomba, Kuduro is really like 140 BPM, like techno. And Kizomba is kind of like salsa. Like they, they know it well in Ghana. There are many expert kizomba dancers, probably even in this audience. Really? Uh, yes. yes. I, I, I take people kizomba. anything to yeah. move hips and <laughs> in Ghana. I mean, uh, yeah. It's trust me. You don't have to explain kizomba to them. No, I take very serious. <laughs> like, for example, I'm, I'm walking. I'm walking with this with this uh, bag for a reason. Reads kizomba design museum because that's how serious I take kizomba. Mm. Because when I moved to Lisbon in the mid-90s, I realized um, most of us, while in that country, of course, we worked on really shitty jobs, constructions, cleaning, and restaurants. And all those uh, professions, um, which is more like a hustling between something, yeah. you know, until you return home, um, people were really sad during the week because I lived downtown so I could really see people arriving from the buses and the boats to work in the city and they uh, walk with their heads down yeah the eyes on the floor but when came Friday you will see that community of people coming back to life because we had we would gather go to those clubs the Kizomba clubs, and dance uh, until 6, 6 a.m., because that's, uh, that's the way we roll in, in Angola. We dance until the, the dawn, until the sunrise, sorry. A and so for that, for that reason, I felt like Kizomba was kind of like a sanctuary mm -hmm. for our community. This yeah. is the, the place where we, and because Kizomba, you dance together, so you feel the warmth of the other body, and a body that recognizes you that knows exactly where you come from, that knows those songs, and know the meaning of those songs. That was so important to put it in a book. So on the first version, I went in, I put information about the, like, the, the, the policies yeah. to take down the slums on the 90s that brought those communities together. Because before, we had slums in Lisbon, but you had the Angolan slums, the Cabo Verdean slums, the Guinea Bissau slums, not everybody living together. Yeah. But when they did the social house uh, projects, they put all that people together, including the Portuguese. That's why if you go to Lisbon now, the most popular music, aside from Fado, which is very sad and, and, mm -hmm. and, and boring, sorry, <laughs> not this, just <laughs> the truth. Um, you have Kizomba, top chartings, everything, because of these interactions, like mm -hmm. people live in the same neighborhoods, going to work in the shopping malls. Mm -hmm. So you have this soundtrack carrying uh, a group of people. I felt like I, I had to write it. Had to, yeah. So on this version, I tried to diminish that and just focus on the characters, focus on the, on the stories, and what really makes this book stand out from the yeah. pers perspective of the publisher, of course. Yeah, but I mean, I, I think you still do a great job of telling the stories of musicians, like older musicians that inspired, you know, the, the, the rise of Kuduro, the, the changes in Kozomba and all of that stuff. And I, I don't know about you, but for me, some of the first storytellers I encountered in Ghana were musicians. I very often tell the story, um, you know, th that the first I knew of subversion, really, I learned from A.B. Krenzel when he released a song called Moses um, in, uh, in, the, in the 80s. 
because at the time they used to have a censor board for songs and Moses was a song that was orchestral in the beginning and um, bluesy a little bit after that orchestral like no 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 lyrics and then bluesy initially and then becomes very sexually explicit but it it becomes well in a metaphoric way right but it becomes that somewhere after four minutes so it passed the senses because the senses are they're listening to lots of music and then they're given oh yeah this one can play on radio this one can play on radio so clearly <laughs> they listen to ab cancer and it's got this really beautiful you know opening i mean it's the man is a genius musician anyway. So, and then it passes the sensor board. And then, you know, when it starts playing on radio and it gets popular, suddenly the, the, I think it was the churches that first noticed. And they're like, this song has to be banned. Because when this guy's talking about Moses part in the Red Sea, he's not talking about the Bible, you know? <laughs> um, and when they banned it, because as a kid, I hadn't even, when they banned it, that's when my father then said, you have to listen to this song and explain it to us. So they actually made it worse by trying to ban it. But these songs were storytelling as well. You know, they're talking, you know, yes, there's all of that play. But when it starts, it's like, you know, it's, it's blues. It's like, hey, you're not struggling alone. I'm with you. So all of these songs that I grew up hearing, whether it was Ga, E.T. Mensa, they all had stories to go with them. And so the earliest form of storytelling for me um, regular storytelling outside of my choosing to read a book, the st storytelling you couldn't escape was through music. Um, and I think so, it didn't feel odd for me to be writing a novel that was coming through music. And I feel like because of how you go back to all of those figures and talk about how they changed the landscape, a musical landscape of Luanda, and some of them also traveling with the weird stories of like immigration and stuff when they're traveling, and change Lisbon and stuff like that. All of that is really great in, in you know, telling a story. Uh, I think, we, can we hear something uh, from, the, from your book? I will read a, a little bit, but it's actually not to do with music. <laughs> okay. Um, be, because the, it's funny because we're talking about all the things that you can fit, yeah. that music carries with it. But I also feel like, I mean, in this book, as you say, I, I talk about um, agriculture a lot. Um, because I do think that world agriculture practice suits profit making and not living um, and it is why we have the climate crisis we have now and stuff like that so in this book um, there are two characters um, as you will know Junior is um, somebody who went to Fumaz which is a, a fictional island at the age of 13 to study and becomes a member of the most famous band from the island um, and then the other character Emelina um, is, is born of parents from the island, but goes there when she inherits some land. The land she inherits is saturated with sugar, so things can't really grow from there anymore, and it's because her family have been selling the world's sweetest rice, and they, they cultivated that by watering the rice paddies with sugar solution. So now the, the earth is saturated with sugar. The agriculture minister is explaining the importance of myth Mythology is important. It's like you can't stop growing in this, the original soil, so we have to fix the soil. So this is how they then meet, because Junior is an agriculturist, and he has to help fix the soil. So this is a part where they've taken some mud from the soil, and they're uh, observing it. Um, and so uh, the soil keeping the history of the place in the way that music can keep the history of a place. <clears throat> in a clear glass... The mud from the paddy has a hue close to that of Junior's skin. Dark brown with a queer sheen that hints at vibrant life. It has the skin tone of Fumazi's Taino, descended, descending blue hills with smiles to be betrayed, slaughtered, infected with diseases, raped, pushed back into the green. It has the rebellious brown of the Mambises in the jungle, hidden and emergent only at their will. The shade of kidnapped women who walk miles barefoot threatened by whips, still carrying songs beneath their tongues, stamping harmonies in the undergrowth. It has the many grain texture of men shackled from Africa, hair matted and plaited into triangular partitions on the scalp, kinks recording the turns and betrayal of history. It has the uneven skin of maids making family, weaving holes from what was broken. It is the color of heritage. It is the color of sweet molasses, of unbound bruises. 
It possesses the granularity of families beaten by Hamatan sand while queuing for food in Sahel sent drought. It has the same sick, sinking weight as flesh, the density of struggle, of blood. Yunior lifts the glass to the lamp hanging above them, where they sit around a corner of the grand dining table, forming on an even triangle. So. Uh, and, and something also about your book that st struck me, and I think we, I have a lot here, is this idea of returning mm. and also departing, you know, like, and, and how, uh, like, sometimes when we, when we go back in history, even the history of the slave trade, people were moving. Yeah. Yeah? People didn't s stood still in one place forever. The people that managed to get the freedom and came back and returned uh, mm -hmm. to, the, to the place where they were enslaved or their families were enslaved. And you, in your book, really pinpoint that migration within the, the, the African uh, di diaspora, which yeah. is, is brilliant. Yeah, I mean, I really wanted to kind of, you know, the myth of migration is always like everybody wants to go to Europe, but majority of migration from Africa is actually within the, 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 you know, the, the global south. It's not actually to Europe, and I, I wanted to play with that. But yes, you know, returning is, is a thing. You know, I talked about the chorus. A chorus is something we return to in music, and I feel like the structure of your book has that. And I think um, using music also allowed for a kind of circular storytelling in much the same way that music goes. I think maybe this is a good time to get the audience to ask some questions. Um, because otherwise, we can ramble for days, and, and we, we can do that. We prefer to do that with alcohol, given how we, we met. But um, you guys are an intoxicating audience, so we'll turn to you. To, to, to help them to get courage to have a question, I can make one. Okay. Why Spanish? Why Spanish? Yeah. Um, because in th there's a way in which the Anglophone world has a dominance of global media. And so very often, especially in the spaces where I've moved, when we think of um, the terrible exploitation that slavery was, we think very much in Anglophone terms. And sometimes people can, can forget that the role that the Francophone and Hispanophone world played. So I thought it would be a good thing to use a fictional Spanish-speaking island. But also I wanted to pay homage to some of the Latin American writers I read when I was growing up, like Garcia Marquez. Um, yeah. Yosa, uh, you know, that, that whole crew. Sorry. I was just wanted to ask, could you, Kalaf, read something in Portuguese? We want to hear the music. Okay. Uh, Do you have it on your... I, I don't have the book in Portuguese, but let me, let me try to find something. Can I read something, like, that resembles a, 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 a poem? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah anything? Absolutely. Okay. Um, uh, okay. This piece is called Wambu. It's a is a um, is a a state in the middle of Angola, where my grandfather was born. Novamente, Wambu. Terra do velho Faustino e Palanga, meu avô. Vim aqui parar porque lhe desconhecia o caminho, o cheiro, a cor, o tempo. Não havia como negar a visita. Eu que sou movido pela curiosidade e não me canso de admitir a minha ignorância diante do assunto Angola. O que sei, deu-me ela, ou melhor, suguei-lhe dos jovens seios, tão rígidos e tão doces como uma boca, como dizia a canção. Angola, tenho de ciúmes, os mesmos no qual vive entregues no alto do seu amor febril, todos amantes desse mundo. Se não fosse teu filho, te pedia em namoro, te fazia pedido, alambamento e todos os mambos, e adotava todos os filhos que pariste, cujos pais se fizeram ausentes, uns deportados para as Américas em navios negreiros, uns desaparecidos em combate, 
ou simplesmente que te voltaram as costas e te deixaram mais viúva do que mulher de finado. Há muito que não me visitava. Sim, estou aqui a saudar-me, regressado de uma viagem longa. Por onde andaste? Por que te demoraste? Afinal de contas, quem és tu, ou forasteiro na sua própria terra? As respostas não me saem fáceis. Eu sou esse órfão cultural que mal sabe contar até dez na língua dos meus pais, dos pais destes e para aí fora. Mossi, Vale, Tato, Kuala. Cinco, seis, sete, nove, Equi. Como vem, não venho visitar nenhum parente. I come to visit myself. Uh, is that a final question there? Okay. Uh, as musicians, uh, on an average of three minutes, you can transform all the people in this audience into different worlds. And uh, you write this book, it probably must have taken a while. Is it frustrating for you as a, a creative person where you can spend a little short time, write lyrics and transform stadia and you know, people's emotions and now we have to read this book for us to get the same effect? How is that process for you? How do you reconcile the two? Um, so, I mean, just because something takes three minutes to listen to doesn't mean it takes three minutes to create. So, I mean, I, I think that's kind of a misconception we can get. Some, I feel like no matter how short the art form, there's a process to creating it that might be similar. Um, because songs live you know, within us for ages before they, they come out as lyrics or, or you know, poems or whatever. I don't know what you Yes, and, and it's easier to write a long form a piece than a short. Because you need to condense so much feeling, so much emotions. And with, let's say, a, a novel, you can just go on prosing, 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 just with the beauty of language and sounds, not necessarily trying to be meaningful and just try and experiment things that on the short form, you don't have that excuse. You need to go straight to the point, most of the time, of course. And it's more scary to be on an audience where you can distinguish everyone's uh, faces than be on a stage with 10,000 people because you just see at most a thousand and the rest is just a blurred. So it's quite comforting on that sense. So this is more scary, way more scary for me at least. Thank you. In introducing the two, I describe them as specialists. They argue, what's your verdict? They are specialists. They're special. They're special. Yeah. Once again, uh, Niai and uh, Kalaf. Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. You've made it so chatty. It's been wonderful. Great voice. Oh. I like the clear, resonant voices I heard. Next time, pillows on the audience, please, so people can <laughs> fall asleep. <laughs> Yeah, that brings us to, uh, they'll, be, they'll be going to the uh, left and sign for whoever buys a book. So while that is going on, I spotted uh, Kina somewhere, and I'm happy to see her here. We shall be having the welcome note, the keynote, and to deliver that will be Aminata Fauna, another great, accomplished writer, author, And as soon as she mounts the rostrum, I will find my way out there. Uh, and and uh, to support her would be Kina Likimani, uh, who I have a lot of admiration for. Ladies and gentlemen, the last of our session. But we shall continue tomorrow as well. But for today, this is the last of the session. To be spearheaded by Aminata Fona, with a lot of support from Kina Likimani.
In the meantime, the band can give us some strain. while we do the changeover. So that starts at 4.30, so we shall have some music and interaction and, and more books to buy, more books to autograph.
projects dear to our own hearts. In this way, I produced and directed some of the films of which I am most proud, documentaries about Africa's history, culture, and art. Still, I had to use this other voice to do so. Being asked to speak in a voice not your own is a particularly disorienting experience, a form of W.E.B. E. Du Bois' double consciousness, or, in less stately terms, a mindfuck. <laughs> to view your continent through the white gaze, you must pretend not to know things you do, in fact, know. To ask questions to which you already know the answer, to simplify stories you understand to be nuanced, to assume zero residual knowledge on the part of the viewer, to always begin with A, B, C, when really you want to move on to R, S, or T. We, the black reporters at the BBC, used to joke about the sorts of stories we were sometimes asked to cover. One particular type of story we called the black people do it too story. Black people ride horses, as though the Hausa horsemen of North Ni northern Nigeria had never existed. Black people do farming, as if swathes of the continent had not been feeding itself for millennia. Black people do ballet, as if a tradition of formal courtly dance was not practiced across the continent. Black people do art, as if Picasso's Demoiselle d'Avignon had, had not directly inspired by the art of the West of West Africa, sorry, as if the Demoiselle d'Avignon by Picasso had not been directly inspired by the art of West Africa. A documentary I'm proud of, and one that still goes out on the BBC World Service, albeit with a younger, slimmer version of me. So I made it in 2009. Uh, well, I made it in 2008, and it went out in 2009. It still goes out, and every now and again, somebody I haven't seen from, for a very long time calls me from a hotel room and says, wow. You haven't aged. <laughs> uh, it was called the, li the, the documentary was called The Lost Libraries of Timbuktu. Actually, we heard quite a bit about them this morning. It tells the story of the tens of thousands of ancient manuscripts dating back to the 14th century that originated in the universities of Timbuktu and of the daring and ingenuity of the people of Timbuktu in hiding their existence from the French colonists for a century. It is indeed an inspiring story, and yet somehow still a black people do it too story. That is, have scholarship and education and places of learning. Of course, we, all of us, reporters of African origin, resisted with all the tools at our disposal. And I reserve a word of admiration for those black and brown correspondents who've continued to do so. Editorially speaking, the BBC of 2023 is a very different place from the BBC I first joined in 1989, largely due to their efforts. In 1999, I left the BBC to find my own voice. And the rest, of course, is the history of my career as a writer. I've often said the happiest two days of my career as a journalist were the day I first walked into the BBC and the day I walked out of it. The particular impetus when I quit a very well-paid job overnight was the war in Sierra Leone, which is my fatherland. In the 1990s, there was another war that unfolded and ran its terrible course at the same time, and that was the war in the former Yugoslavia. Both wars were reported by roughly the same set of war correspondents, representing various news agencies. But while the war in the former Yugoslavia was reported with all its history, context, and political nuance, that in Sierra Leone was not. It was reported as though the mindless savagery with which the white gaze had long associated the continent had leapt from nowhere. We might call this the black people doing it again story. With supreme irony, the war in Sierra Leone was reported as tribal, which it was not while the Yugoslav conflict was not reported as tribal, which it was. Instead, reporters came up with the wonderful euphemism, ethnic cleansing, which is still in use today. And so I left, and I wrote The Devil That Danced on the Water, which was an account of my family and my country's history, of how a nation implodes for reasons which, as it turned out, were not so different from the former Yugoslavia. In other words, reasons that were social, 
political and economic. Ethnic identity in the former Yugoslavia was used, as it is in many places across the continent and elsewhere, to mobilize people to turn one against the other. It was never, however, the root cause of our conflict in Sierra Leone, or even one of the most overriding features thereof. Today we live in times when so much talk is about identity. Sometimes it seems obsessively so. Perhaps then it's worth thinking for a moment about where our identities come from and the ways in which they are created and shaped. Narrative identity is a relatively new term and the idea is one that's attracting interest among psychologists. Simply put, we all carry with us the stories we've been told about ourselves and about the world. We each construct our individual narrative identities in much the same way, starting off with the fables and folk tales told to us by our parents, add to that family lore and personal stories, popular culture, formal histories, and the so-called master narrative of a society. These combine with our evolving experiences. All of this we internally accept, reject, reframe, or rewrite. Two psychologists, Dan McAdams and Kate McLean, describe narrative identity thus. Narrative identity is a person's internalized and evolving life story, integrating the reconstructed past and imagined future to provide life with some degree of unity and purpose. Our narrative identity is a vital part of our world outlook, how we respond to opportunities, challenges, and setbacks. McAdams and McLean enumerate those elements of narrative identity which can be associated with higher levels of mental health and well-being, or happiness, among them agency and meaning. In writing The Devil That Danced on the Water in the face of so much misreporting of the war in Sierra Leone, as well as an authoritarian regime's deliberate and deceitful reconstruction of our country's narrative, agency and meaning were what I took for myself and gave to the story of my family and the war in our homeland. The title of this gathering is Reclaiming the Narrative but we have always told our own stories. I think what we really mean here is reclaiming the master narrative, placing ourselves at the center of the stories and the world, employing what I would like to call the black gaze. This is what I've sought to do in my writing, whether my books are set on the continent, as in The Memory of Love, in which I play with the white gaze, such that the book starts in a way familiar to certain readers, with the white man in Africa and his gaze upon the land and its people, only to switch so that the gaze, instead of belonging to him, is upon him. He is being viewed through the lens of the black gaze, and it is a starkly uncompromising gaze. It is the gaze making the judgment against whose history and culture and values he, the white character, is now being measured. In The Hired Man, this time, the gaze belongs to the author who looks at the Yugoslav war from the knowledge and perspective of an African one. At the time of publication, some people did not regard that as an African book because it was not set in Africa. However, I did and always have, and I'm glad to say that it is increasingly taught in universities on African literature syllabi. In Happiness, I brought a character, a psychiatrist from Ghana, <laughs> to Britain, where he viewed the British people, their behavior, and their actions through the lens of a professional black gaze. In a recent book of essays, The Window Seat, I recalled a moment in Timbuktu whilst making the BBC documentary to which I referred earlier, and still feeling then under the burden of the white gaze, a moment that illustrated so pithily the reversal of that gaze that I turned it into a short, very short essay. Here it is in its entirety. 
in Timbuktu. In Timbuktu, I stopped a man to ask him the way to the post office. The man had a question of his own that he wanted answered first. Is it true, he said, that in Britain people have a thing about Timbuktu? <laughs> yes, I said, people think it's very far away, like the furthest place on earth. At this, the man laughed for a long time, and then he gave me directions to the post office. I think, like me, writers from the continent have been hard at work constructing the black gaze on paper, and though we are too many to name, certainly the list includes all of the writers in this room. We have never been short of writers claiming, creating, reclaiming narratives. And last month I was at, the festival in, at a festival in Nairobi where I watched and took part in events which commandeered audiences of upwards of 200, 300 people. I signed books until my wrist ached and I talked to local booksellers and reveled in their enthusiasm for the authors and our output. Among the writers, talk was how amazing the event was. Had others been to the Ake Festival in Nigeria? I listened to someone explain how they'd cracked the Nigerian market by going there. These were conversations I couldn't have had 20 years ago. The festival was followed by the Nairobi International Book Fair, which hosted international publishers and book buyers. And of course, as we heard this morning, uh, Ghana, Accra, is the UNESCO center of the book this year. Several thoughts came to me at once. For this experience, as joyful as it was, and as indicative as it was of how the center is shifting, was nevertheless all too rare. But it was also potentially the greatest sign of hope for African writing. It seems to me that we're enjoying a moment when writers of African origin are producing and being published at a greater rate than ever before. As Western-based publishers look to increase their markets, they're casting their nets globally. And yet two parallel and seemingly contradictory shifts are occurring. Writers of African origin are rising, and yet our overall opportunities are declining. Publishing is in a perilous state. Certainly in the English-speaking world, it is harder than ever before for a writer to make a living from the pen alone, certainly when it comes to literary fiction or poetry. The Authors Guild of America recently conducted a new survey of US author incomes with preliminary results showing that full-time authors earned a median annual income from writing-related activities, which is teaching, speaking, and whatnot, of $23,000 a year, of which an average of $12,000 a year was from their books. Now, let me put that into context for you because it sounds like a lot of money when you say it in Africa. But in America, where everything costs a fortune, it isn't as much as it sounds. The average American salary is just over $59,000 a year. So in the States, writers are making well under half the average salary. For writers of African origin, I'd hazard this figure is lower. For publishers still and too often treat our books as niche. Today, the new business model of publishers is to put increasing amounts of money into promoting big sales in celebrity memoirs and genre fiction, where advances can sometimes run into millions and less and less into literary fiction. The operating principle of publishers being that the true artist will write no matter what, therefore obviating the need to pay us. In this, they may not be wrong. And this is why I'm here to say that we do not need more writers, though of course, the more the better. Writers are doing great. What writers need are more champions. In my two decades of writing, I have only ever been edited by one editor of African heritage, one. That includes my main editors and all the junior editors and line editors that work on a book, a short story, or an essay. I've worked with dozens of editors in my writing life, whether in publish, publishing or in literary journals. One editor of African origin. Editors are the gatekeepers of publishing. But other people, other people in the industry can also make or break a career. The marketing and sales executives can be your friends, 
but are more likely to be the nemesis of a writer of African origin. They can determine well in advance of your book being published how many copies you are going to sell. They do this by deciding upon the site of print run, the sales strategy, the marketing budget, and all else that goes into a campaign. I had a book, The Hired Man, the book of which I've spoken, that is set in Croatia, in the former Yugoslavia. Critically, extremely well received. And yet it produced underwhelming sales, because the sales team claimed not to understand it. What they wanted to know was a black woman writing about Croatia for. Meanwhile, bookshop owners were telling me that the book was doing really well, that they'd sold out, but, th but that the sales team was refusing to supply more hardback copies, presumably because they'd run out, not having printed enough in the first place. The foreign rights team made no attempt to sell it to foreign publishers. I was told that they had said they didn't know how to market it. My Dutch publishers bought it anyway because they'd had success with my previous books. In Holland, The Hired Man became a bestseller. Sales and marketing teams can be unmotivated, especially by that with which they are not familiar. They can also be downright wrong. That one African editor I worked with once gave this advice. When you choose a publisher, don't just look at the editorial team, look at the sales team. Sales and marketing teams like what they call author subject harmony. Yeah, not really nearly as nice as it sounds, right? Which in simple terms means write what we expect you to write. Don't step out of line, don't climb out of your box. I was back in a variation of my experience at the BBC. I was writing with a black gaze but I was selling to people who were looking at me with a white gaze. Always we are in need of more editors interested in publishing our books. We also need more sales and marketing teams that reflect our intellectual range and creativity. We need more booksellers to sell our books. We need more publishers, both homegrown here on the continent and overseas. I'd like to see African publishers seize the moment and beat the Western publishers at this particular game. When young aspiring writers come to me asking how to get published, I want to, which I actually increasingly do do, be able to push them towards publishers in Africa. Also, we need more prizes. As marketing budgets shrink, publishers increasingly put more emphasis on the prizes. Thus, it was a special delight to me to see the number of writers from the continent who were recipients of Yale University's Wyndham Campbell Awards over recent years. Zizi Dangaremba, Emmanuel Iduma, Sifiwe Gloria Ndlovu, Jennifer Makumbi, Helit Makumbi, Helon Habila, Ted Cole, Johnny Steinberg, Zoe Wickham. Marginalized voices such as black British, African American, Asian American, and LGBTQ writers are seeing the value of creating dedicated prizes for their own works. So to a regional publishing markets, children's literature, science fiction, crime. There are prizes for young writers, lots and lots of them, <laughs> and even a few for old writers. There are probably more prizes dedicated to Scottish writers than African writers. I know because I'm sometimes asked to judge them, being a representative of both geographies. Prizes attract attention, provide an opportunity for publicity, galvanize sales departments and impress readers. I'm delighted to see the Mabati Cornell Kiswahili Prize for African Literature and the Nine Mobile Prize, formerly the Etisada. Let's have more. It is beautiful to think of writing as an art. And it is an art. But it is an art like all art that ultimately relies on a buyer. To reclaim our narratives, to place ourselves at the center of the master narrative, to own and direct the black gaze takes more than a fountain pen and a garret, or even a laptop and a writing retreat. Writing may feel like a solitary endeavor, but it is not. 
Everyone accepts that a film needs actors, directors, producers, distribution houses, and cinemas. The same is true of books. Authors weave their narratives. Editors refine the prose. Designers craft captivating covers. Marketers promote the stories, and sales teams ensure those stories find their way into the hands of readers, wherever in the world those readers may be. Africa coined the phrase, it takes a village, so let us live by it. Thank you. Good evening. Wasn't that lovely? Clap again, clap again. Um, thank you so much. You know, I've done, um, I've moderated quite a bit, and I am so nervous. Um, because I am thoroughly in awe of you. Um, let me go straight into it. Eh? My favorite, have a book, uh, my favorite is The Memory of Love. Right. Um, Um, I read it some years ago, and um, it, um, it blew my mind. And today, when, you know, when Frankie asked me to moderate a body or your a conversation your, on creating a body of work through writing, um, I thought that with you, it's a body of characters. It's your characters. And in A Memory of Love, my favorite character is Kai. Um, you know, we, 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 we talk a lot about migration, so we should, right? The, the, the project to dislocate and de deracinate Africans and black people from where we should be is always ongoing. So sometimes you, people think they've made a choice to migrate, but actually, maybe the choice that, that the choice has actually been taken from you and you have to go. But in A Memory of Love, there is Kai, who is um, rooted, but let me also qualify and say you can be rooted and still leave. But he's one of those people who, right from the beginning, he was never going to leave. Was that intentional? Can you talk a bit about Kai? Uh, first of all, thank you for your kind words. Yes. Uh, Kai Mansare. Um, the only character I've ever, re ever created who gets his own fan mail. <laughs> <laughs> Women love him. Men want to be him. Um, uh, Kai was never going to leave. And when I wrote The Memory of Love, I constructed it very deliberately in that way. I started with two characters. One was the British psychologist, um, and the other one was an older African character, who was telling his story to the British psychologist. And we can talk about why that um, uh, dynamic existed. But uh, at some point, I realized, actually, someone has to stay and hold this story, right? Somebody, the story has to stay in the country, and it is of the country, and it stays in the country. And Kai was going uh, very early in the book. He was going to be... Uh, he was always going to be a main character, but he wasn't going to have his own voice, right? It was always going to be this, um, th this dynamic between the two men, uh, the, the older African character and the outsider. And then I decided that Kai really needed to have his own voice because somebody was going to stay and somebody was going to hold that voice and somebody was going to pass that narrative on to another generation. It wasn't... If, if, I mean, it's... It's going to be a spoiler, but, you know, somebody... <laughs> yeah, one person was going to leave and something was going to happen to the older guy. Can't remember what it was. <laughs> but anyway, somebody had to have the story and somebody had to be guardian of the story. And so I created Kai. And in, in then actually bringing him in later, which was uh, not 
the way I had originally designed the book, but the way I left the book. It gave it this elliptical shape, you see. It began with the two, and then it became three, and then two fade out, and it's left with one. And so I, um, it's one of those happy creative, I mean, that's what creativity is, isn't it? It's one of those happy moments where it works for you on the page. And I do resolve a lot of these things on the page. I don't think abstractly. I'm not a good chess player. You know, I can't think abstractly about every move and every piece before I do it. It all starts to take shape, really, on the page. So, sticking with characters, because you do, we'll come to the big themes, right? Do the books come to you in the form of the characters first, or is it the situation? The character always comes first. So it's the characters that come first. Well, I mean, I, it's a hard one to answer, isn't it? Because there are things that I'm obsessed with anyway, and I'm thinking about them all the time, and therefore they are, you know, whatever it is I'm obsessed with is going to become the theme of my next book, right? Um, or a book. I mean, sometimes it takes 10 years. I can obsess for quite a long time. I mean, you know, so sometimes it does take a, a very long time for, for me to actually find the form. And when the form arrives, it's because a character has arrived. It's so, because I found the person through whom I can okay. tell the story. So from my point, you're obsessed with war. For, for very good reasons. <laughs> yeah, yes, she's obsessed with war. And you know, when we had the conversation, I, I didn't tell you this, but when you then moved from the memory of love to the hired man, I had a conniption fit in Accra. I was like, what is she doing? Where is she going? Why? You know, literally, I remember I told my mom, this is like, why? Is she no longer an African writer? So then I, I read the book, and I was like, oh, you still have me now. Because <laughs> it was war. It was war, but not only war. It was, it, was, you, it was the way you wrote. Again, the characters, how, you know. So let's talk about war. Has your views, why war? I know why war, but has your views on war changed um, through the years in your works? Um, yeah. Well, it's funny, you know, the only people who were not amazed and surprised by the hired man were the good people of Croatia, <laughs> because they saw the connection completely, right? So, uh, you know, quite often I would give talks on that book, and the room would be full of people from the former Yugoslavia, and they'd be buying it, you know, stacks of copies to take back home to Croatia. And it was, what was really fascinating, and I toured Croatia with that book, I toured Bos Bosnia with that book, what was really fascinating about talking to audiences there was how, first of all, I didn't have to explain it, right? They understood, you've come from a war, we had a war, right? We both had civil conflicts. We are, this book is something that is mining the reasons for those civil conflicts, which were very, very similar, as I said in my talk. Um, uh, so, you know, that, but the, um, so they, ha they had that thought. Ah, I'm totally lost where I was with it, actually. Never mind, I'll come back to it. I was asking whether your views on war has changed. Oh, yeah, I know you asked that, but I was thinking about something else, about the good people of Croatia. Oh, I know what it was. Right, sorry, so it's like an elder moment. Uh, I know what it was. Um, I've forgotten again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I know what it was. I know what it was. I know what it was. Yeah, you know, you'd think I'd been drinking, wouldn't you? Right, I know what it was. It was... It was <laughs> It was that they said to me, you are, a lot, number, the number of people who said to me, only you could write this book. And they said, because anybody from inside Croatia would always be assumed to be on one side or the other. Everybody would be looking for their partisanship. So in a way, it was kind of interesting to see the whole debate the other way around. You know, in, in the States and in Britain, it was, how can you write a book set in, in Croatia? And in Croatia, it was, thank God you said a book set in Croatia. So there we are. I'm back on the ball now. Yeah. Your views on war? Oh, uh, my views are... Well, you have, they changed. I don't know what... I didn't have any previews, you know, of war. I didn't know what I thought a war would be, but um, until we had one, of course, um, in Sierra Leone. Um, and I think what was interesting and, and speaks to your question is... There was a prelude to that war, and until I wrote The Devil That Danced on the Water... I did not, which was, a, if you don't know, it's a memoir and it's a story of my father who was a political prisoner throughout many, m most of the 1970s. He was executed when I was 11 years old uh, because he opposed the government 
uh, in Sierra Leone, which then turned into a dictatorship. Uh, and when I wrote The Devil That Danced on the Water, I really began to see the steps towards civil conflict, right? There was just nothing about this that couldn't have been predicted. And indeed, my father had predicted it. Uh, on the day of his death, he had written a letter to the nation in which he had entirely predicted what was going to happen and that the country would end in war. And 25 years later, the letter came out. What had happened was, just before his execution, a journalist was sent from one of the newspapers to interview him and some of the other men who were condemned. The trial was called Mohammed Fauna and the 14 others, and my father was, was Mohammed Fauna. And so a man, uh, journalist was sent to interview uh, two or three of the condemned men. I suppose maybe they were supposed to plead for their lives or something, but anyway, my father had written this letter and he gave it to the journalist. The journalist, by that time, the entire, all the newspapers were under state control, but what the uh, authorities didn't know was that this journalist had once been a follower of my father. So he took the letter and he hid it for 25 years and it came out in the year 2000. He died and his widow found it and she gave it to a newspaper to publish. It was the first time I had seen it and it completely predicted what was going to happen in the country. So there was this voice from the grave saying, we are going to end in war and there we were in war. So in, in the sense, did my views on war change? No, but uh, because I'd never really thought about war that deeply, but, but in the sense that I now know that there is a very exact trajectory to war, uh, which countries you know, can sometimes avoid. Right? There are, countries have chances to avoid uh, a civil conflict. And I'm talking here about civil conflict, which is what I know about, not international conflicts. There's a moment when a, a, a country can continue down a path or may have an opportunity to pause. And there are some countries in that position right now, um, <laughs> naming no names, um, but you have to know what those steps are. Uh, but I think the fact of the matter is that there are plenty of people who know what those steps are. It's a matter of whether the country chooses to listen to them or not. Okay. Um, so you start creating this body of work with the memoir. Right, which for a fiction writer, so the question I want to ask is, after you write, you do the memoir with all the research, and when did you decide what what prompted now the fiction writing part? Because um, it seems to me that a lot of people do it the other way around. They explore the war in a in a fiction book initially. You went from memoir to then writing fiction. What, and then in answering that question, address also what, what is the difference between the two? What, was, what does fiction provide for you that may, um, we obviously know what the memoir is, yeah. Mm. Uh, well, I think sometimes there's a story that you probably just have to write out, you know, out of your system. And, and if you have a big story that's a true story, um, I mean, for some people it might work to mask it in fiction. It didn't work for me. There was, th there was a mystery and my family and my country wanted to know what the answer to it was. And that was, you know, how and for what reasons and by whom had my father's death been orchestrated. So, you know, there was something really, really important to me about confronting those people at, who were still alive, right? There was something really important about doing that. And, about accountability. So that's why it had to be a memoir, it had to be a true story. And I do remember my sister who was in, you know, at the beginning at not entirely convinced about whether I, she wanted to be part of that project. And then one day she said, wow, she said, you know, you kill somebody and then 25 years later the phone rings and it's their daughter. <laughs> um, so, so there was, you know, that I had to create that moment of accountability. And I had to know what was, what the true facts were, right? And there's it's something Nadine Goldemer said, although it is now ascribed to me on the internet, by the way, because I keep quoting it, uh, which is why you shouldn't trust the internet. Uh, and it is that nonfiction reveals the lies, but only metaphor can tell the truth. Uh, and, and this is very true of my career, nonfiction revealed the lies, right? It revealed the lies of a state. Uh, but when it came to 
talking about something else. You know, each of my books begins with, this, with a, a, a question that I want answered. And therefore, I really needed to turn to metaphor to find the answer to that question. So let's take the memory of love, for example. I mean, the question I had, having spent so much time talking to people who had um, been part of a country on its way to imploding, and listened to them give an account of themselves and their actions or inaction decades later, I really wanted to write about that. How does one generation account for their actions or inaction to the generations to come. So that was where the memory of love came from. So there was kind of this abstract thing that was bothering me, which I'd, I'd sat there listening to people lie, obfuscate, um, or, or be honest, depending on what their particular choice was. And I just became really interested in, and when it, it takes us back to narrative, the, the idea of narrative, I became really interested in how does a generation who were part of something account to a, a generation before that, so each book has really begun with a, each uh, novel has really begun with a question. And with The Hired Man, I wanted to know, does, it, does the same thing, can the same thing happen anywhere? Right? If it can happen you know, in one place, is it, is it the same in another? But the other question at the, at the bottom of at the base of The Hired Man was, how do you get a neighbor to kill a neighbor? How do you get a neighbor to kill a neighbor? And I, you know, I spent some time investigating that and found the answer. In what, okay, so I think I know, but tell us, please, the question you were trying to answer in happiness. How'd you get there? <laughs> <laughs> happiness, um, in a way, happiness was the answer, not the question, actually. So, you know, I spent 20 years writing about war and writing about trauma and... Um, uh, and I had had this extraordinary moment which really led to the, the, the memory of love. I've been researching the memory of love and I've spent a lot of time in hospitals. I mean, I do my research on the ground. That's what I love about being a writer. I know some people, everyone does it different ways. I actually inhabit the life of the person that I'm writing about. So Kai, who, of whom you are so fond, is a surgeon. Uh, I say is a surgeon because to me he's still around. But <laughs> Uh, Kai's a surgeon, and I, I was actually spending a lot of time in operating theatres, watching amputations and things like that. And um, I'd come out of uh, 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 spending some time in a hospital, and uh, my aunt had a coffee shop and restaurant, and I stopped by her. And she said, oh, you know, if you're interested in these sorts of questions, why don't you go and talk to Dr. Naeem, who runs the Mental Health Institute? And I was like, mm, is that really my thing? You know, I was really concentrating on um, orthopedic surgery <laughs> at that point. Anyway, I rang him up and he said, come, come, come. And he was extraordinary sort of combative manner. And he said, come. And I went to the, um, to the mental hospital and I saw the very, very, very thick end of the wedge of post-traumatic stress disorder. It's one of the reasons I get really agitated when I hear particularly young people in America saying they've got PTSD or saying they're traumatized, because I know what it looks like, and you are not, <laughs> okay? Um, you may be in pain, you may be suffering, uh, but you haven't got PTSD. But, so I saw what these people looked like, what, you know, what they were going through. And he said, but he said something really interesting. I mean, he gave me a free run of the place. I spent quite a lot of time in the mental health facility. Um, but he said to me one day about the cut nation on the whole. He said, you know, these people are gonna be okay. These people are gonna be okay. And I was just like, really? Because at the time, it was like post 9-11. People were kind of visibly shocked. You could see the shock of war in people's faces. And I spent 20 years writing about war and the antecedents to war, the prelude, the aftermath, you know, war itself. Uh, and you know, my focus has always been on the non-combatants, right? Um, because in a civil conflict, actually in both civil and international conflicts, you are far safer if you are a soldier than if you are a civilian. The rate of civilian casualties outnumbers the rate of uh, combatant casualties like nine to one. And if you're a woman or a child, you're even worse off. So I was always much more focused on, on, on civilians. Um, but you know, 
uh, 20, where are we now? You know, 20 years after that war was declared over, people in Sierra Leone are okay, right? They are okay, he was right. And so I just, I found that very, a very interesting thing to write about, really, to see, you know, what happens in the end. What happens, how do people eventually come out of a war? Is there recovery from a war? And, you know, the answer is, well, the answer's in the title, right? Uh, but it, it, there's an exploration in the book about what, what, what is happiness, you know, what exactly is happiness, what can we expect when we, when we search for happiness or we wish for happiness, what is it we can expect? So let's stay there because in your, um, again, because, and it's not because you're writing about war, because there are people who write about war and they don't have a running, the running theme of uh, trauma, psychologists, um, the mental health aspect, surviving it, living with it. Um, so let's stay there because in an interview I'd read of you, you did make this point about not everything is traumatic that people say it is. People are actually resilient, but also this idea that uh, some societies are better placed to survive um, these traumatic events than others. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah. Um let me think about where to begin. So, I mean, the, the first thing is, you know, people talking, describing themselves as traumatized. And I mean, there's a whole industry around trauma in the Western world. You know, I mean, a lot of therapists making a lot of money telling people that they're traumatized. So, and of course, the more you tell someone they are traumatized, the more likely they are to begin to mimic those, yeah, exactly, <laughs> to uh, produce the, you know, <laughs> symptoms that are responsive to that. But, so, you know, I always say, let us be clear about our language. And I've really had to think about this language over 20 years of, of writing about it. So I say suffering and pain are not the same as trauma. Trauma is the damage that will not heal. Okay. So you may be in pain, but you, most of us will heal. The traumatized person is the person who, who cannot find, who cannot heal. And that's the difference between the two. And, and, and we shouldn't use them interchangeably. Do some societies promote that kind of healing and do some societies exacerbate it? Yes is the short answer. So if you come from a society where people understand essentially that shit happens, right? You grow up knowing that your life is not going to be perfect. You are already you're already armor-proofed against trauma, right? A society which has an expectation of perfection, of happiness, of seamlessness. And sometimes when I'm talking to Western psychologists and they say, you know, they, they assume that everyone, they, they sort of assume traumatic experiences or if they see somebody in any kind of difficulty, they'll say, well, there must be some inciting incident, what happened, what happened in your childhood, and eventually they'll find I don't know, a divorce, a, a pet died, whatever, you know. And they'll decide. <laughs> I mean, I'm not being entirely flippant, you know. No, yeah. <laughs> it is not untrue. Um, and, you know, and they'll find something and, and they'll decide that was it. And so sometimes I've challenged those therapists and I've said, paint the perfect life, right? Tell me what it looks like. The life in which nothing happens, nobody ever dies, right? Your grandparents never die. I mean, what does this perfect life? And it's kind of really fascinating that... Every time I've asked a therapist this, they draw a blank. And yet somehow we've got this idea of this life in which we're all going to be happy. This sh I always call it this shadow life, but maybe I should... But it's in, it's, so this shadow life in which nothing bad ever happened to you, and that's the kind of person you would be if only you, had, you, know, you were living your shadow life. But, but this doesn't happen. It cannot be. <laughs> right. So... So, you know, what societies mitigate against trauma? You know, one that accepts that, that shit happens. One that can support but not catastrophize. So one of the other terrible things that you see is, my life, your life is ruined. Her life was ruined, right? She was attacked, her life was ruined. The minute you tell someone their life is ruined, you're going a long way to helping that be the outcome. Uh, so these are the things. And, and then the other thing, which is why... I, which is why I think uh, most, and I, and I want to generalize, but I'm, I feel you're just going to agree with me on this one. Most African countries are so well placed to be resilient. Humor, right? I mean, if you can laugh 
And if you come from a society which is better at laughing in the face of adversity than crying, uh, you're, you're, again, you know, heavily uh, supported in, uh, or, or, or you're very likely never to become traumatized. Not to say that you will not be in pain, but you will not be traumatized. Someone came to Ghana and was like, oh, they sit on radio laughing. <laughs> Which we do, you know. I, I mean, we laugh at, and sometimes you're like, what, what, what was funny in the first place? It's like, <laughs> Something is just a little bit funny, and then the person starts to laugh, and then the laugh becomes the funny. Yes, exactly. And then we laugh. Okay. And you can, you know, you really see how, uh, and I honestly have never seen this in the United States or Britain or I don't know, Germany, but you can you see conflict resolved with laughter. So, like, if you, if you get pulled over by a, 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 a policeman and he's all angry and annoyed and yelling at you, and then you know, the driver might just say something and start laughing, and the policeman starts laughing too, and suddenly the conflict gets resolved, right? I've never, ever seen, I can tell you, never seen that happen in America. <laughs> if you laughed over the policeman there, <laughs> Lord help you. So, <laughs> so um, before, I'm going to go to the audience, so start lining up. So my last question, people questions, my last question before I force them to ask you a question is, the themes are big, you know, war, love, maybe, um, you know, trauma. In the end, a book has to be entertaining. And I feel like a lot of the times we don't want to, we don't discuss how entertaining a book is. You know, we go into the themes. Your books are so magnificent to read. Very entertaining. <laughs> yes? Yes. yes. Okay. So how do you do that? I like to ask, right? Like, do that. How do this? Because even the opening, you know, let's, I'm the last panel, indulge me here. Sometimes you are reading a writer and how magnificent they are is even the stories they throw away in the prologue. It's so annoying and lovely. You do it, Jennifer does it at the beginning of Chintu. You do it at the beginning of happiness. There's that whole Wolfer story. <laughs> and basically it's like, it's, it's so enjoyable, magnificent, it's sweet, it could have been a novel in itself, and you just had the nerve to stick it in the prologue. <laughs> Start off with this story while we get to it. How do you people do that? Well, uh, I don't know how, but I did it by just sticking it at the front of the prologue, but uh, as a prologue, but w the why? Uh, because I, I had this great idea about this wolfer, yeah. and I thought, I've really got to use that, because that's such a good story. So... You know, I just had an idea. The, the beginning of happiness, uh, it, it, uh, the whole book takes place in London, but there's a prologue and it begins in the northern United States and it's it, it, theoretically the death of the last wolf. Um, and it, it, it's really about how we treat, the book is really about uh, many things, but it's about how we treat animals um, and what that tells you about a society. Uh, so actually, you know, I was really glad that my publisher didn't take it out because publishers normally don't like prologues. It's a thing, you know, now in our Netflix age. They want you to get straight into the story. Straight into the story. Preferably with a okay, bomb going off or something like that. You know, they want action. So the idea of this sort of lazy prologue that took place 100 years before anything else in the book happens and, you know, and the, and the characters never come back, I thought it was a big risk, but my publishers really liked it, so we stuck with it. It was just too good to lose. I mean, that was my feeling about that. But in terms of how do I make my books entertaining, I mean, I have to be entertained, right? You know, and if, if I'm getting bored writing, well, then we're all in trouble. Uh, and sometimes, if now and again, I get a, a, a student, my students are very, very young, and so nothing on the whole, they haven't, someone calls it stuff in their stuff bank. They haven't got much stuff in their stuff bank. You know, not much has happened in their lives. And so they say, oh, you know, I, 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 I don't know what to write about. I don't have anything to write about. And one of them said to me, you know, I start writing about something and, the, and then I get bored. And I thought, okay, just stop, just stop. Right, go away, live a life, then come back and be a writer. So uh, if I'm bored, it, it's a problem. But it's, it really comes back to, you know, your favorite Kai Mansaray. People, I make characters that people are invested in and I'm invested in them, and I have characters that I really, really, some of them I, I would not wish to be my friends, right? So, 
You know, you're always asked, who would you invite to dinner? I mean, there are characters I've created here I would absolutely not invite to dinner. And if I saw them coming down the road, I would bolt the door. But I'm invested in them. And the reader is invested in them. And the reader is invested in, in understanding why they have made the choices that they have made, whether the choices are, are choices that the reader would make or agree with. Um, I mean, and the character I'm thinking of, who you know is, is the main one of the main characters, Elias Cole in *The Memory of Love*, and people have very mixed feelings about Elias Cole, and that's the you know the whole thing about him was you were supposed to have mixed feelings about him, and I've had people come up to me buying that book and saying, "God, that awful man," and other people coming up to me and going, "Elias Cole, what a guy," <laughs> you know. <so laughs> You know, uh, it's about making characters that people are invested in. And that's me, of course, you know. I mean, a, a thriller writer will write a thriller, you know, wonderful plotting, make sure that, you know, that the reader can't figure out what the ending is. You know, everyone's got a different mechanism. For me, it is absolutely character. Thank you. Questions? Yes. While you're talking about characters that we get heavily invested in, um, it occurred to me, only listening to you speak now, that this morning we were listening to two women and two men where we're sort of, in the culture, I think in general, and writing has been interrogating men using women as their primary character, and yet when I was reading Happiness, it never occurred to me that your main character was a man. And it never, I never questioned your right to do so. Um, nor did anything about him ring false. Um, so I want to ask you two things. One is, are you aware, do you feel in any way that that's transgressive? Because we're holding a lot of male authors to account. I was and then, hoping to avoid this question. <laughs> but let's go on. Yeah. Yeah, and, but, then, but then I have something that will help you out of it. Because also, when I was reading it, you know, he is a Ghanaian psychiatrist in London, and Dr. Attila Asari sort of overshadows the whole book because he's such a wonderful character and you just love him so much. And it occurred to me while I was reading it, the two main white characters, Rose and Jean, are, and I'm not criticizing their development, they're just sort of dull by comparison. <laughs> okay, one is in severe last trauma of Alzheimer's. Trauma is not the right word. Um, but. But I notice that you develop all of these wonderful characters in London, the ragtag army of doormen. They're like, oh, Ghanaians do this, and people from Sierra Leone do that. And you put together this army that helps Attila go look for the missing little boy. And were you intentionally, it was almost like you were shining a spotlight on these invisible people in London and the more typical Londoners, the, the quells, the posh people, they're sort of like in shadow. We, it's like the spotlight's on the wonderful people who a lot of British people might argue didn't even belong there. Well, I'm glad you said at the end a lot of British people don't notice because uh, a lot of the time uh, when that book is being discussed, people said, uh, critics wrote, the, the invisible people, the people none of us notice. And I thought, well, I see them all the time. <laughs> Right, I always notice them, and, and one of the reasons is they always notice me, you know, and, and it, it all, the, those characters, those doormen and the um, people in the hotels, uh, service staff in the hotels, really started from being on tour with my books, and I would go to, especially in the States where a lot of doormen and service staff are West African, I would, as soon as they heard my name, it was just like, oh, wow, here we go, you know. If I wanted, a, if I want a taxi, they'd butt everybody else out of the queue, yeah, madam, you know. I'd get a taxi. If I wanted to eat after midnight, don't worry, we'll keep the, the kitchen open for you. You know, uh, all these special little niceties would come my way because I was West African and because they recognized that, you know, my name and that I was West African and they were always pleased to see, a, you know, woman of West Africa on the road doing things, giving talks. So they were always highly visible to me and I was always highly visible to them. So it always interested me that people, you know, I thought, it's kind of interesting that there's a whole swathe of people who are just walking past all of these actors in their life. You know, you know our kids call them, they call them non-player. What do they call them? NPAs, non-player, no, NPCs, non-player characters. Is that how they refer to parents, you know? It's true. No, we're non-player characters in their lives. But anyway, 
But I just thought it was kind of fascinating, and I thought, why don't I bring them to the fore and make the, you know, push the people who expect to be the centre of the story. But the other thing you'll remember if you read Happiness is, is that the foxes uh, have, and because I'm extreme animal lover, and I, uh, I, I've always noticed the foxes in London. I've been fascinated by them forever. And, and I was really astonished when that book came out. People went, are there foxes in London? And people who lived in London, I thought, you never noticed. Well, what do you think those things are? They're just lots and lots of stray dogs <laughs> or odd-looking cats. I don't know. But, <laughs> but I, I think that it, people, it depends on what your sensibility is. And, you know, you walk, my husband, for example, he walks through a city, he sees architecture. I do not see architecture, I can tell you that. Right, I do not see architecture. I see foxes and pigeons and doormen and, you know, so it all depends on your eye. But to go to that first question about appropriation, it's really fascinating that um, I think it's about power dynamics. And I think, I think two things. One is I've really got no time for this whole cultural appropriation thing because this is an imaginative art, right? Writing novels is an imaginative art. And if you look at my novels, you will not find one single woman in late middle aged who is half Sierra Leonean and half Scottish. There isn't one. So actually, every single person in my novels is not like me. Right. Some of them are elderly village women in... Uh, in uh, ancestor stones, uh, some of them are men, some of them are white, you know, some of them are all kinds of things. And sometimes I've had conversations with, with uh, usually young people in the United States and they talk about cultural appropriation and, you know, and, and usually it's white people mustn't be allowed to write characters of color. And I, and I guess, uh, well, we heard this morning questioning whether men, well, I don't, I don't suppose anyone actually questioned, could they write women? But, you know, there was a sort of question about it, wasn't there? A question about writing women. And, and I, you know, so I say to my students, OK, I wrote a book in the voice of a white man. And they go, eh? And I say, yes, I created a character called Duro. He is a peasant. He is a, a farm worker and a sniper, by the way, in Croatia. And... Not only did I create him, not only is he the central character, I also wrote it in the first person. Is that okay? Now my students begin to wonder, oh, right, hang on a minute. Is it okay? And they decide that it is okay because they hadn't thought about that before. <laughs> and so, I, so when I really pressed them, in the end, you know, we, they sort of realize that it's going nowhere. Right, saying in, in terms of fiction, saying you can and cannot write this kind of this sort of person. We have to have a multiplicity of characters in books or they wouldn't work. And I think if you don't like there being a multiplicity of characters and you don't like a writer being able to write anybody they want, I mean, I've even inhabited the sensibility of a fox, for heaven's sake. Um, then you should read nonfiction, right? That's the only answer. If you, do, if you don't accept it's an imaginative art, you probably are engaging in the wrong form of art for you. You should read non-fiction. Uh, so I do, uh, but I, I, and I'll also say this, I am not an essentialist. I don't think that people are simply one thing because they're male or one thing because they're female or one thing because they're black or one thing because they're white. What I do with the character is think, if, I, if, if, I, if, I, if I'm trying to imagine my way into a male character, I think, well, how is, life to, how is it life to get, how is it to go through life as a man? I mean, there's a heck of a lot of freedom for a start. <laughs> Once I taught myself to piss standing up, but that didn't work so well. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I decided, you know what? They really, really oversold that one. <laughs> they really oversold that one. But uh, freedom, and what would it be like to be, you know, I mean, you, you can imagine what it's like to be those people. And I, and I joke about when I write male characters, I don't have to worry about how to get them home safely at the end of the chapter. <laughs> right, you know, they, you, can't, you can do a lot of things with male characters that would be extremely unusual in a woman's life. But, you know, you don't, uh, but also we are not, 
but, 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 but for practical reasons, not because a woman is ever incapable of those things. And I sometimes think, if you looked at me on paper, I'm more stereotypically masculine than a great many men I know, right? I can shoot a gun. I mean, I learned to shoot a sniper's rifle when I w was uh, researching the hired man, and I could hit a bullseye at a mile. I would like to know if any of the men in this room can do that. Uh -huh. Aha. <laughs> you and me both, right? You know, I mean, I can ride a motorbike. You know, I've looped. The, I've taken the controls of an aircraft and looped the loop. I've got quite, you know, sort of. I'm not an adrenaline junkie, but you know, I've got quite a high enjoyment of adrenaline. And I know many men, you know, for whom, I, you know, the height of adrenaline is. I don't know, getting up to turn on the sports, right? So, you know, we, we think in stereotypes too much when we um, when we think about maleness and femaleness and blackness and whiteness. Yeah. Um, so Hi. wait, let's pause for a minute here. No, stand. Okay. I'm an atafona can shoot a rifle. I mean, like, yeah. Sniper. A sniper. sniper. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> love, love. Thank you. Yes, Juan. Um, I feel like you were speaking to my soul when you were talking about trauma and, you know, the difference in how people use words. And I'm very interested in your ideas around how language is evolving around these things now. So there's a lot of, you know, when people use words like harm and safety and even and trauma again. And it's so obscured that sometimes you don't know whether maybe somebody just said something to a person or whether the gravity of the situation, you know, um, something as basic as, you know, your mother shouted at you and it's like, oh, you were actually abused as a child, you know. And, you know, so I'm, I'm very interested in kind of knowing your thoughts on because there's so much obscurity at this point um, and how this language is being used as well. So I'm just, I'm just interested in knowing your thoughts about it. Oh, gosh. So we take two questions at once. <laughs> I can have a think about that. Okay, so my first question <laughs> uh, would be, um, what was the most difficult character to write in the memory of love? Um, also because I feel like, like all three characters are very complex. So I want to know which one was very difficult to write. And then how much research went into developing the character Adrian Lockhart, the British psychologist. Okay. Um, about this language about harm and feeling abuse. Um, you know, it's, it's, very, it's very common in, in the United States to hear someone say, I didn't feel safe. They made me feel unsafe. Uh, and I, I, I'm not, I don't want to diminish that someone feels in some way unhappy. But I mean, I, I, I don't know what they're saying either because I never feel safe, actually. I mean, I don't, we live in a world that is by definition, unsafe. So I'm not sure quite where you are going to feel safe, uncomfortable. I mean, I sometimes think it's probably better to say that person was being an asshole than to say I feel unsafe, right? But, but because we now live in the age of the victim, we always have to turn it on ourselves and say, I, you made me feel, I felt because that appears to be the way now, and I'm talking in Western terms, you get some kind of agency. Whereas if you just say that person is an idiot or that person is you know, insulting or whatever. Um, I mean, I, I feel the same way. One of the things I get also exasperated about is people being offended. And I say, actually, why don't we just say that that person is extremely rude, right? Instead of saying, I feel I'm offended, by the way in which you've talked about me as a person of color or a woman. Why don't you say that person is really rude? Um, but, but uh, you know, we have decided to... Um, I, I, it can only come out of the language of therapy. It can only come out of the language of therapy, right? Because that's what therapists do, isn't it? How do you feel about it? How do you feel about it? How do you feel about it? And it's kind of interesting, I mean, here is... You know, I'm not an essentialist, but we, we grow up in cultures and we grow up with sensibilities. And one of the things that that Ghanaian, uh, he's not Ghanaian, the psychiatrist in Sierra Leone, so the psychiatrist in Sierra Leone that I met and I went to Dr. Naeem, and he knows this, so I can tell you, he inspired the main character in Happiness 
But it is not him, right? He inspired that character, this sort of combative psychiatrist, who almost kind of anti-psychiatrist, who, who, who rejects so much of um, you know, what has now kind of become a conformity, conformist thinking in psychology. Um, and uh, <clears throat> he, t he talked to me about externalizing and internalizing cultures. And he said, well, most African cultures are externalizing, so they're far more likely to say somebody's a, somebody's a jerk, <laughs> right? Whereas Western societies are taught to be internalizing. What is wrong with me? And, and it's a, you, know, you, you hear it like in the American success story. If you're not a success, it's your fault, right? That you know, everything is about the self, the individual. You make your luck. You, you know. So I guess there are internalizing and in externalizing cultures uh, yeah and those of us who are at the nexus of all of the of both of those are the ones who are trying to figure out what does this language what does this language mean um the second question uh which was about which character and adrian lockhart um okay here's something you asked me about my characters but they're very sharp-eyed you'll notice adrian lockhart existed in ancestor stones right he's in the last story in ancestor stones and you may also notice that <coughs> Attila Asari exists in The Memory of Love. So both of them were minor characters in previous books, and then I brought them into another book, and I hadn't intended to do that. I, um, with Adrian Lockhart, actually, I had the character of Elias Cole, and I wanted Elias Cole to tell his story to somebody, and I wanted that somebody to be an outsider. They had to be somebody who didn't know the country, so that they essentially didn't know whether Elias Cole was telling the truth or not. So, uh, you know, I was sort of ruminating it on one day, probably going for a dog walk or a run, and I thought, oh yeah, Adrian Lockhart. I thought I'll bring him back. Um, and also it gave him a chance to redeem himself a bit, because in the last story in Ancestor Stones, he'd been a bit of a twit. So I thought, I'll get him and I'll give him another chance. <laughs> uh, so, uh, how much research did I do? A lot. Um, I, well, I, I mean, for that particular character, I'd done a lot of it because I'd spent a lot of time researching trauma um, and talking to trauma specialists and reading books on trauma, and I'd spent all that time in that facility in Sierra Leone with people who were traumatized by the war. So I had a lot of residual information by the time I got to write him, but, I mean, over the span of time, yes, I did a lot. Who is the most difficult character to write? Hmm. Probably, probably Elias Cole, because Elias Cole equivocates, and it was quite hard to get that balance of, do you trust him, right? Do you trust him? And that was quite hard to do. And I remember when I gave the book to my agent, he said, you know, this guy, he's just so awful. Now, I mean, we're going to talk about agents another day, so I'm not going to give it away, but good agents do this, right? You hand them your manuscript. And after, uh, my agent, fortunately, always comes back to me really, really quickly because he knows you're going, you know, you're on tenter hooks. And then he says, it's brilliant. You are a marvel. And he tells you all the ways in which your book is fantastic and you're the best writer he's ever represented. And then about three weeks later, you have lunch, and he'll say, just a couple of things. <laughs> and so, uh, and he was concerned about the character of Elias Cole. He thought Elias Cole was just too unpleasant. The book then went to my publisher, and he said, don't change anything, right? He said, let it go to the publisher, let's see what they say. The book went to the publisher, and my editor said, Elias Cole is fantastic. And then I knew, and I said that to my agent, and he said, well, in that case, you've done it, right? Because people had completely different views of Elias Cole. So he was the hardest character to write, and it really depends on who you are and what your, what your value system is. But the other interesting thing, recently somebody reacted to Elias Cole to me, and they said, I don't feel... I don't hate, I don't dislike him. I actually, I understand him and I quite like him. And I said, oh, that's really interesting, why do you say that? And he said, because I grew up in Russia and I know what it's like 
to grow up under an authoritarian regime, a highly oppressive regime where one wrong word or step and you can lose your freedom if not your life. And he said, I understand the choices that man was making. So uh, for all of those reasons, Elias Cole was the hardest to write, but um, I think he worked out. And, and, and I think I, I loved Elias. No, I don't love him, but I, I appreciate the fact that he was in the book. I, cause I grew up on Cape Coast University campus in the 70s. You know, it reminded me of at the time when I was growing up, there would be the leftist and then what my mother's people called the reactionaries. And the way they even mentioned the word reactionary, you knew they were very bad parents. And the people who colluded with governments that they weren't supposed to. Um, so I really, really, um, Elias is fantastic. Fantastic in the sense that, yeah, she's marvelous, marvelous job. Question, you, look, don't go home and then be like, oh, I wish I had. You have questions about crafts? Any other questions? Writers, you want to ask questions? Yes. Hi, Aminata. Hello, Annie. <laughs> <laughs> um, you talk a lot about the characters and you talk about Kai and, and other characters. And I just wondered, is there any character that forced their way into the story where no matter what you did, they insisted on being part of the story? You, you know, you just talked about two characters that you brought into another story. But was that, that urge that they had to be in the story where they were never going to go away no matter what you did? I'm now working my way through all my books and trying to cast myself back 20 odd years. I'm going to disappoint you by saying no, I don't think so. I mean, I talked about Kai, and, and he really was the one that, you know, I originally hadn't thought of giving such a big role to, and then he became bigger and bigger and bigger. But when I think about the other books, um, well, it, I suppose in, in The Hired Man, there's a daughter called Grace. And, you know, she was never going to be a particular part of it. It was really going to be Duro and Laura, and the dynamic was going to be between Duro and Laura. And I suppose Grace is the sort of Kai character of that book, which is, you know, the, the, one, who, the one who really sees what's going on. So, you know, the dynamic between... Duro and Laura is that Laura has bought this house in Croatia and she's pretty oblivious, right? She's oblivious to what has happened. She doesn't know and nor does she wish to know. And Duro knows, right? Duro knows what happened in that town and he knows what happened in that house and he's holding on to the story. And Grace is the young girl and Grace can see what's really there, right? She can look below the surface and she can see what's really there. And so she's the person who can suss out that there is something about Duro and something about what Duro knows that isn't being said. And so, yes, I would say that in that, that if, if there's a character I never saw coming, it was Grace. We, 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 okay, no, no more questions. I'm closing. Um, one question, there's one more question. Is that Hazel? Yes, it's Hi, Hazel. me. Hi. Let me not take over the chairing, my dear, but <laughs> we are over time. That's why yes, these good yes, people yes. are. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. I wasn't here to ask the question, but I have to ask anyway. So I want to ask from your, the, the, when you started the, the presentation you did about being a journalist and then having to uh, come from that profession into writing. Uh, how easy was, is it for you to make that decision or how difficult it was? And the other question is, I mean, writing, uh, for you being outside, being in England and writing about certain situation in Sierra Leone, and uh, for writers in Africa who are actually in the system and then seeing some issues, like they say, corruption, and then sometimes you don't have the guts to really write because you don't want to be labeled. I think you actually mentioned that. Uh, how do you deal with that? Because, you know, when you come out with such books, of course, you'll be labeled by a certain group, and then you'd really need the strength to actually 
uh, bring that out? Uh, what advice would you give to someone like that? Well, in the sense that, you know, my main residence is in Britain. I have somewhere else to go. Um, but I, I'm never outside Sierra Leone because, you know, my family is there. I'm there all the time. I have a house there, you know. Um, and bank accounts and, you know, all kinds. So, uh, you know, I, I regard myself as still being in Sierra Leone, but, but I have the safety of another place, right? I have the safety of another place to go. Nevertheless, I really had to think about it with the devil that danced on the water because there were... You know, there, there were real issues of security for my mother, uh, my stepmom. She was living there, and I was very concerned about her safety at the end of the war. So, um, but I mean, I wrote it as I saw it, and then, and I decided that, well, you know, I, I wasn't going to show anybody the book, but I showed it to her just in case she felt that she was going to be in, in, in personal peril. Uh, but she decided that. You know, we'd gone this far and we were carrying on. And, and I named absolutely everybody. You know, I confronted it. I named everybody. But, it, but you know, from, uh, you know, it, I had somewhere to go. But I had people there who didn't. So I was still somewhat compromised in that way. And it's very difficult. I remember Helen Habilla telling me that when he told his mother he was going to be a writer, she started crying. <laughs> and it was because she thought he was going to prison, right? You know, she knew what kind of writer he was going to be, and she thought he was going to go to prison. So, it's really, really difficult. And and and, but but being a journalist sort of prepares you for that. I mean, I think if you have that sort of sensibility, I, d I don't think you can. You know, you either are that kind of person or you're not that kind of person. And, and as a journalist, one already is that kind of person. You become a journalist because you want to confront societies. You you be I mean, a certain kind of journalist because you want to expose injustices or corruption or whatever. Um, it, you know, it's bred in the bone. The other question, uh, which was, how easy was it for me to leave? Oh, like that. I mean, overnight, I walked out. I mean, my, I resigned, and my, my, uh, my editor said to me, oh, so when do you want to go? You know, in, in two months' time? And I went, hmm. And he, do you know, end of the day, I said... And he went, you cannot. I, I just signed a contract, that was it, you see. I'd signed a contract, I'd gone home, and I thought, no, terrible mistake. I went back in, I said, terrible mistake, shouldn't have signed it. Can we ignore it? Of course, because there's no point holding me to it. So, so I, I was out of contract. Um, but he, he felt that, you know, I should stay in a, a month or two, that that's what I would want. And I didn't. Once I was out, I was out. I made up my mind and I was going. And I've sort of pretty much lived my life like that. I mean, now if, if a young person did that, I'd go, oh, well, no, you should think much more. And do you really want to take these risks? But I was that kind of person. I was always a risk taker with my career. And, and, if, and I've always had a real, real trouble doing what, things that I don't want to do that my heart isn't in. So once I decided to go, I went. And that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Round of applause. I want to thank um, Frankie for these opportunities because, how? Oh, and Aminata, thank you so much. And thank you, audience. Bye. Yeah, thank you very much, Aminata. And uh, Kina, you held us spellbound. There will be book signing on the extreme left. And tomorrow, we continue the sessions. In the morning, you can bring along your kids. There are books for children as well. We welcome children tomorrow. And we'll have more and more exciting moments tomorrow. So we welcome all of you again to join us tomorrow and the day after. I want to thank all of you on behalf of the site director, Frankie, who's pulled this off. And we're looking forward to more and more of these sessions. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming.